The following program deals with a controversial, controversial subject. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. The viewer is invited to make a judgment based on all available information.
the top talents in the comic book business are here to tell everything they know. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Industry of Comics show. I am here with uh, my two co-hosts, Mr. Jesse James and Dennis Barger of Jesse James Comics and Wonder World Comics. How you doing, guys? Been a pretty fun week. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I just came back from uh, Tampa. I cruised a whole bunch of new comic book stores out there and... You know, I've been over the last four years, I've been to about 400, almost 500 comic book stores across the nation. And not only is every comic book store different, you get to these pockets where it's a complete different culture, right? And uh, so learning these cultures, what's hot in that district uh, versus what's uh, hot in Glendale, not even close. I mean, we're in two different ballparks. I'm expecting to see uh spawn and lady death and every sh store out here nope <laughs> it's uh it's it's almost basic stuff it's almost like yeah. superman batman in in the east coast which is crazy uh to see that when you walk into stores as high highlights i think the big thing that i notice is a lot of foilness uh, i don't even know if that's a word if it's not i'm coining it yeah um lots so, of so uh, yeah so it's, it was fun today uh cruising those new stores Nice. So I did the same thing last week. Uh, I started hitting the area of Marietta, Georgia, outside of Atlanta. And so I went to go visit a friend of mine and a friend of all of ours, uh, Cliff Figures at yep. Dr. No's Comics. And you, you really can't even, you can't even start to scratch the surface of this guy uh, and his 50 years in comics. Um, I mean, he created Comic Shop News. You know, he's still the publisher of it, I think. Uh, if not the the day to day publisher, you know the, the overarching publisher. Um, he's expanded his store, doubled the size over those times, um, and you know it just and it's such a meat and potatoes comic book store. But it has you know for those customers that's the meat and potatoes. Then literally, uh, my friend Jeremy uh, took me up the road. He goes, oh, here, there's a comic book store in this flea market, this antiques mall, and I was like, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll go. I'll humor you, you know. And I met this kid who literally worked in a comic book store, had to sell the comic book store uh, years ago, then got back into flipping comics during COVID, came out of COVID, opened a little store in this antique mall, and now he has, and I kid you not, it's a 500 square foot footprint in an antique mall, and it's gorgeous. Yeah, you can see my Instagram there. So that's me with Cliff. Like I said, meat and potatoes, comic book store, Dr. No. And then uh, this this kid over here on the right is John. Is it John? Sy yeah, John at Syndicate Comic Shop. And while I'm in there, this this guy on the left here, the, the other guy, that's my buddy Jeremy who took me there. Uh, the guy on the left, he's like, are you Dennis Barger? And you go on the, the Beyond Wednesday show every once in a while? And I'm like, yeah, he goes, I, I watch your show all the time, man. You're, you're, I love it when you're on there. So he just happened to be shopping and he starts going, yeah, I changed my store to this guy like a year ago. So you, you get the, you get 50 years experience and 15 months experience in a two mile, three mile strip of Marietta, Georgia on the same road. And you couldn't have the two stores be night and day. This, the other guy has a nine, four, Hulk 181 sitting on his back counter. He's got amazing slabs all over the place. Cliff, I don't think I saw a slab anywhere in the store. So it, it's two completely no. dichotomous retailers, two completely different experience levels right up the road from each other. I just, yeah, I, that, I love it. That's how it should be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you guys... 28 live watching right now if you guys could hit that thumbs up button hit the like button whatever you want to call it it really helps us for the live show it helps push us out a little bit further in the algorithm uh youtube has been doing some weird things lately for people that do mostly live streaming and this is what i'm hearing from multiple uh, other youtubers big youtubers subscribers seem to be dropping unintentionally like 
if you subscribe to Beyond Wednesdays, you might go check to see if you're still subscribed because subscribers have been uh, being taken off by YouTube um, and we're finding that out. I had somebody hit me up the other day and say, man, I've had to resubscribe twice to your channel because I wasn't getting the notices that you were going live and it says that I'm unsubscribed and I haven't unsubscribed. So there must be something going on, some well, weird thing. Wh what happened on Friday? Because I was watching the Almost 10 and all of a sudden it dropped out of to nothing. Really? And then, yeah. And so then I, I kept going, I kept trying to recycle it and it was showing me old shows. And then all of a sudden... I get a notification uh, that top 10 was on. So I go there and it was already at number six before I got the note. I literally went notification click and it went on. And it was six and you guys and I scrolled back and you'd been on for 30 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. It's been very weird. So, Shout out yeah. to Haven for Heroes who's in the chat. He says, sup fellas looking good. Thank, Thank you, you Emmett. Yeah. One of the good guys. Um, yeah, and so he it's just been... started. He just started that new series over on his channel as well. So if you haven't seen that, go check it out, everybody. Yeah, shout out to Igor, Thomas, and our boy D. Hope mm -hmm. you guys are doing good. Heroes Reborn Comics in the chat, yo. So yep, um, appreciate all the constructive criticism, also, you guys, and uh, also if there's anything you you want to see from you know guests or stuff that we talk about, let us know. We're kind of uh, figuring this out as we go. We have ideas on what we want to do, and I think it's starting to work out. I think this sh this show is is uh, kind of taken off a little bit. I've had a lot of people reach out to me since the start of this show, and um, how how good it's been. So it feels well, good. Well, and I I think when they see the guests we line up tonight, and more about the type of show that we're trying to build and and talk about and discuss, I think that it will just keep growing. Yeah, and then every week after that is just going to just build on the previous shows. Yeah, yeah and I think you know we're we're kind of doing it the opposite of what a retailer show is by you know yeah we can talk and all that, but once we get into unfiltered time, it it kind of takes the pressure off my back and Dennis's back to kind of say okay, we're just going to talk. And traditionally, you don't do that as retailers on any type of show, any type of forum, any type of platform. You don't even do that at technically conventions. Um, and so this allows us to uh, not only express uh, how we feel the industry is going, uh, but uh, kind of describe the culture that is going on behind the scenes uh, in the industry part of the comic book world which technically in some worlds like in in brian's other world we're kind of like the small fries of that because we don't have a lot of people in that world uh yet on this flip then uh it's a small group of people so it's very interesting yeah well it, it occurred to me also uh i think it was last two shows ago where you're talking about us you and i at retailer summits and yeah. everybody at dinner s sits far away from me or jesse and Right. But the funny part was, is, and it didn't occur to me until after that show when you mentioned that, except for during the breaks, yeah. everybody's coming over and they want to pick our brains on what, how we're doing it and what we're doing. And because we are doing something different always. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yep. So we got, we got a great show tonight for you guys. Uh, we got a couple guests coming on that we're going to bring on uh, soon. Uh, and we got a lot of stuff to talk about. Have you guys heard anything new uh, about the Mr. Pink saga uh, or the Scout comic saga? I want to reach back and see if there's any, been any new news that maybe you guys have heard on uh, some well, topics that we the, talked about. Part of the Mr. Pink saga that I, I'm not talking about the Mr. Pink saga, but I was watching Thorough again, and he was talking about Swaggle House's video. Uh, and that um, that journalist who's been following the case, Paul Lesko. They ex Paul Lesko, thank you. Um, he is reporting that they have extended the deadline for answers due to a possible settlement, mm -hmm. which a lot of people see as a payoff buyout. Let's get this thing done because, as as everybody knows from watching any law show, um, discovery is a yep. double edged sword. So as much as you can request his bank accounts and his eBay accounts and all of that stuff, his lawyers can request all emails pertaining to this, all emails pertaining to that. And the rumor is that there's some stuff in there that CGC does not want to have to give up and have in open records. 
So yeah. they're just going to make these two cases go away because it's been more of a black eye than they wanted. Right. And they might not even, you know, even talked about discovery at this yeah. point. Uh, I think that's something that uh, when you start getting into discovery, uh, you, you've one side has said, you know what? F you do what you got to do. And mm -hmm. that forces the other side to go into discovery. And then you come out of discovery. And that's when, when you get out of discovery, uh, that's when it really gets red hot uh, because you can't hide from that stuff. So it'll be very, very interesting. I think as a whole, these companies know that they need to do two things. They need to keep on selling. And the second thing is they keep need to keep on protecting their brand as much as possible. And protecting your brand sometimes is being quiet. Well, right? and, just being and quiet. just like we were talking about that two weeks ago as well, um, uh, if you notice this week, all of the buzz, all of it, like half of my Instagram feed is, oh, do you see Action Comics going 3.5? Oh, it's going 4.8. What's it going to go to now? What's it going to... And that's what I told everybody. That's all it's about is this auction company has to get that record and that then forces another auction company to have to beat that on the next one. And it's just an escalation. Um, you know, so it's like, okay, we see how it's going. Everybody's pay attention to this $4.8 million uh, action comics and don't worry about all the scandal over here. Haven for Hero yeah. says, did you see that they are sponsoring free comic book day through Diamond? Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> so explain and, and that no to choice. us. What does that mean? Why is so that a comic bit... book day is an organization okay. that works with diamond to promote the free comic book day. That organization solicits donations, uh, sponsorships, sponsorships, and you can, sponsorships. you can, yeah. So if you came and I, I can't remember what it was, it was like falling skies or some sci-fi USA network sci-fi show. And they gave Free Comic Book Day a million dollars. And they used that to print bags, I think, or... Yeah, there's print bags, yep. Yeah. So, but we still had to buy the bags. Did We got yep. some of them for free, yep. but we still had to buy the additional yeah, ones. Yep. So other times, Discount Comic Book Service sponsored an ad on the back of the DC comic that year. Well, we all hate Discount Comic Book Service because they undercut all retailers so they had to apologize for that i can't remember if they reprinted some or i can't remember but so free comic book day the organization they're out there looking for money to keep things afloat to keep their their organization going even though it's paid for close to a million dollars a year by retailers to buy into these comic books plus the shipping goes to diamond that's their profit so when you start looking at all this money it's still always the retailers who pay for it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. So I think it's just uh, you know they're doing it for awareness, branding. Uh, a comic book store will choose on Free Comic Book Day how they want to do their Free Comic Book Day. Uh, I think it's um, Free Comic Book Day is very interesting. It's a lost leader for a lot of us, but we're trying to get that one more customer. Um, okay. You know, when I was doing them at Extreme, when I was opening up at midnight, Brian, I don't know if you ever came to oh, midnight yeah. one where oh, yeah. Yeah, five to 700 people at midnight. Lines right? around the building, uh, yeah. Yeah, lines around the building. And um, so it, it is a very interesting thing. I think as we get closer to it, we can have a conversation on how that actually works on the back end, uh, because that is very interesting. It's a scary moment for new stores. Um, and for season stores, they make those decisions. I haven't done one in three years. Uh, we do a just a customer appreciation day. We don't even buy the books. We give our own books out that we had already bought and already have lost leaders on. And that's how we kind of do it at our store. So, Well, and Thomas Bishop down in the chat was uh, free comic book day has good intentions, but it shouldn't be at the cost of comic book stores. Now here, Emmett, uh, I'm going to ask Emmett a question from here to the chat. If all of a sudden CGC put in some money and all of the publishers or free comic book day said, hey, CGC paid us a giant check and we're going to pay half of everyone's co uh, free comic book day bills, would you be less inclined or would you be, you know, would it make a difference if some of that money was going to offset the huge amounts of money that we pay? 
Well, and I don't my know. answer, my answer would be yes. I mean, if we're gonna, if free, if they get that money, pass that money to the stores who are the ones paying for everything. Yes, yes. What is the problem? Why? What is the problem with Diamond being uh, free Comic Book Day uh, being through Diamond now? Why is that an issue? Uh, he- Emmett said, well, "Did you see that they are Diamond. sponsoring free Comic Book Day through Diamond?" I'm so effing pissed. I don't understand why that's a problem. I'm trying to figure that out. Um, well, I, I, I think this is a integrity thing on how you perceive your relationship with CGC, uh, and if you don't, if you don't have a good feel about them, then you're then be pissed. Well, and I respect, I respect, I yeah, yeah. respect Emmett's opinion on that. Yeah, exactly. So I think this is a choice. Um, and you have to make <coughs> the right choice for your store. I don't sell CGCs, right? Yeah. I don't sell graded books. So for me, I, I don't know. Right. Well, and that relationship is through diamond and I don't know how all the minutia works, but you know, now that DC's over at Luna, but there's still DC books available for free comic book day and Marvel is over penguin, but diamond sub distributes Marvel at a lower percent. I don't know how all that works because they don't tell any of us really. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I can tell you, you know, the deal is Diamond and Free Comic Book Day. Joe Fields organized this. Diamond nurtured it. I can see why it still has to be a Diamond thing. Yeah. Um, however, my thought is is that a there's a governing board for Free Comic Book Day. There's a lot of people that make a lot of decisions, and retailers are told, "Here's what you get." Um, yeah. I would like to see a lot more transparency with that in the future. I uh, sure. I have a quick question for Dennis that uh, before our, our first guest gets here, I want to ask uh, him real quick. I don't want to get too deep into it, but I saw something very interesting on the uh, YouTube uh, rabbit hole that I was in this morning about old DVDs from Warner Brothers rotting. They call it rotting. Trust me. Yeah, so I watched, uh, and it's kind of funny too, uh, Michael French, who is retroblasting, he actually lives uh, a short ways away from where I was in Marietta, Georgia. And also the Junkman, uh, who's a popular YouTuber in the toy stream, who is mortal enemies with Michael French, uh, he lives on the south end of Atlanta. Um, And my friend Jeremy is friends with both of them that took me to those two stores. So, uh, But I watched retroblasting, and here's the problem. And for, for uh, people that don't realize what we're talking about, let, let me explain this. DVDs from Warner Brothers, the way that they were made, for some reason, after a certain period of time, they don't work anymore, and they call it rotting. Well, and it's based on the cheap plastic they use, the the, the monofilament layer that the info is burned on. Um, you'll see this on like video games that uh, were left out for a long period of time in a smoky room you know we have a disc resurfacer but that doesn't even fix a lot of these problems this is an actual flaw in the disc development that when warner brothers was cranking out discs when walmart was having black friday sales for ten dollar dvds 20 years ago uh that kind of made them cut corners on some of their production and if you look at the guy, it's his his YouTube channel is damn foolistic ideal. It's yeah. a quote from Star Wars. Yeah. And I watched the guy, and he literally put me to sleep twice while he was talking about it because he's just got a very well. He, one thing monotone. that's really good. One one thing that's really good about him is he's created a master list of all. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm not saying anything about it. it's just it's a slog to get through his how presentation you, on the problem. How do you deal with that in a store that? sells physical media i mean that's one of your main things that's a big problem you sweat um, yeah we have we have a 48 hour return policy on media um we have so if you buy a cd or a movie and like today we sold like 200 bucks worth of dvds and a guy came in and goes you don't have this movie called the postman do you i'm like i want to never be out of the postman it's one of my favorite movies of all times Went right over fifteen dollars. He bought it instantly. Um, we sold some CDs today, so about two hundred dollars worth of physical media. And the whole time, I've literally been watching all these people talking about disc rot. But what I think, where I think the disc rot 
is is it's on these little bundle movies that they were cranking out for like $15 for these three classic movies. And if you listen to his list, it is stuff that you can tell they barely cared to put it out. It was in these box sets for that would Old only movies. appeal to a certain certain sect. Like, oh, my three out of the four of my Errol Flynn collection are destroyed. Yes, destroyed. a lot of those those yeah. old collections, like the but Harry Humphrey Bogart collection, Gary. When you would go to Suncoast Video or you know, those things were always the ten dollar three packs or the fifteen dollar three packs. So, and that was when a regular movie cost twenty or twenty five. So these were kind of the discount movies. So I can see why Warner Brothers did it, but here's where I'll say that I'm a lot less worried. Warner Brothers made that guy 80% whole. Like he said, "Hey, my three arrow, Fl- my four of my arrow Flins are are done," um, and so they sent him three of them. But one of the two on his other two movie set had been picked up by Criterion, which meant that the the license is now over at Criterion. So they couldn't reprint him that disc. Do they still do but, that? Will they still do that? Th- that video was like a, a couple months old. So I think, yeah, they're, they're, they're literally in the market of movies on demand. And, you know, I don't know what they're charging, but they literally sent him a giant box full of DVDs to make him whole. Awesome. Well, we'll get into that uh, definitely later because yeah. that's, that was a very interesting rabbit hole that I uh, jumped down and it instantly made me think of dystopia. And, and, Emmett, and Emmett said it too, you know, the ones at Dollar Tree, if you're trusting a Dollar Tree DVD from that little bin of to last forever, you're, you're just out of your mind. Those are a watch at once. And if it's dead in a year, you, you got lucky. Um, you know. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have our first guest of the night that sh- that has just shown up, and one of uh, my favorite people in the comics industry. But Jesse and Dennis, good friends of this guy. Jesse, why don't you go ahead and introduce this gentleman? All right. From the great state of Arizona, the number one Captain America fan in the world, the gatekeeper of the sworn nation. We've got Brian Polito tonight. <laughs> Greetings, you savages. How are you doing tonight? What's up, boys? Good hey. to see you. Good to see you, everybody. Dennis, man, can never thank you enough for helping me complete my Marvel Cups collection. Fellow 7-Eleven Cup collector, yeah, Brian right. Polito. Out of the 60, I got about 32 of them by driving over to my local 7-Eleven, drinking that Slurpee. One of the neatest things is about last year, I was at a local con and I got the actual, I guess, printout. The header, I yeah. I had a copy, but I got the actual printout. So my uh, that was one of my biggest collecting goals achieved. You know, yeah. the, those yeah. old point of sale uh, advertisements and those like, I don't know what you call them, that you set up in Circle K's and stores that they yeah, send out to sale. you. POS, yeah. yeah, those yeah. things are so collectible. And on my market report that I do every Wednesday night, I'll bring up these old point of sale items, uh, you know, from these well, old and stores. I bought, I bought uh, the, the header that goes on top of the, the thing. Yeah. And it's signed by John Romita Sr. Oh, he did ridiculous. a lot of the art for a lot of the cups. So Yeah, he yeah. was the art director at Marvel at the yeah. time, too. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah that stuff, you know, uh, I don't know what it's like to be a heroin addict, but if it's anything like being a Marvel maniac, then <laughs> like, that must be. Because I see that stuff. It's just like, you know, total Yeah, it would, it would be interesting if they actually have the print run numbers on those cups. Because I remember going into 7-Eleven back in the day and saying, dude, why don't you have this cup? Oh, this is the one they always send us, you know, type yeah. of deal. So it'd be interesting if they had counts on that type of stuff. So for what it's worth and everybody, what we're talking about is uh, Marvel teamed up with 7-Eleven for a series of cups starting in 1974 and I believe another series beyond in 1975. My interest is in that first cup because that actually hallmarked my first year ever in comic book collecting. And by the way, I'm here to let you know that this July is my 50th anniversary of being a comic book collector. And yeah, there are the cups. Now, there's information sort of scant, but what I can, what I do know through years of collecting is that they were released in two different sizes based on region. So the Northeast got what we call the tall thin, and that's where the ones that I uh, originally collected. And then the generally rest of the United States got um, short fat and 
I don't think anyone knows what the print runs on these things were. But what I can say is, particularly at that time, no one's thinking about collecting these things. They were cheap. You know, if you washed them in a dishwasher or just washed them by hand, you were screwing them up instantaneously. So it, it is very difficult to find a minty fresh. But uh, again, my brag is through the years and always trying to improve them, improve them, improve them. Mine are pretty minty fresh. You know, there's uh, these cups that Burger King gave out for Star Wars back in the day, yeah. the glasses. And when I bought my home, my first home, the home I'm living in now, my buddy came over and he goes, I got a, a housewarming present for you. And it was a box full of 200 Star Wars uh, oh, glasses yeah. from that time period. The, the strikes, oh. Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, Star oh. Wars, all never used. And to this day, I use those glasses in my house. <laughs> yeah. you know, what's a lot funny of is those are the ones that have the lead in them. So yeah. be oh, great. There. But... <laughs> What is also funny about that is I have the complete set with the original paper bags they came in. I I, as, I do as well. Yeah, that's great. That's uh, awesome. I, I don't. I'll, I'll te tease myself here on this one. So uh, Brian, over in the, the comments, I put a, a link. I actually did. I this is one of my big passions is the cups, and that's why Brian's kept seeing me post these and was like, "Yo, dude, you got these uh, ones I'm missing?" And I was like, "Sure, bro, here." Yeah, he, send, he goes, what do I owe you? I go, send me some comics. And you sent me some bangers. <laughs> so I did the DC Slurpees. I did the Marvel Slurpees. I did oh, the beautiful. Star Wars cups. Beautiful. Um, yeah, so and you, it's basically me just showing off the collection, talking about the art on them. That's et awesome. Cetera. So I have these on my uh, Wonder World Comics YouTube channel. That's man, awesome, that's man. That's a beautiful collection. They look lovely, and the display yeah. is really nice. Yeah, I think one of the reasons why I still love the cups is – for me as a younger person, it was the first time I saw kind of like this um, expansive universe of characters. You know, you saw superheroes, you saw mutants, you saw inhumans, you saw sword and sorcery, you saw supernatural, Western, and seeing all them together, you know, it, it made sense. And to this day, it probably informs a lot of like how I see comics. Well, and Brian, uh, you know, this is one of the biggest problems that I think retailers have talked about in the 20 years I've owned a store, 40 years Jesse's on the store. He's seen it all. Uh, this used to be the best entry level spot for comic books. Yeah, sure. It, you're a kid and you got 25 cents to go buy a Slurpee and you get yeah. this amazing Captain America cup. Yeah. And then you walk right over to the spinny rack, which is right on right by the door. And guess what? There's a 25 cent Captain America's comic book that you yeah. could buy on your way out yeah. and read while you were drinking your Slurpee. Yes. You know, and then you could go turn on the TV on Saturday morning and you could still see superheroes on your TV on Saturday morning. And this is why the boom happened. Yes. You know, and, and we have nothing like that now except for you get TV shows, you get movies, and there's no entry level spot. And that's where Jesse and I have, you know, been talking. That's why I have the retro comic book store. We don't sell a lot of new comics. We sell mm -hmm. old comics as if they were new. Mm -hmm. And we try to create that entry level spot now. Yeah. And it's interesting. I guess it's a shame that there isn't a place for it in the pharmacies. When I was a kid in my hometown, Long Branch, New Jersey, about five or six pharmacies that carried comics. And I'd be the kid on, I don't remember what day of the week. It, it might have been Wednesday or Thursday after school. I'd go around and I'd put the books out and rack them for them. And it, it's just such a small amount of real estate. So it's a shame that it's not there. And you're absolutely right because where they put the spinner rack at a 7-Eleven was sort of near where you'd pay. So inevitably you'd see it going in and going out. And even as we're having this conversation, I'm remembering the first time I saw that great line of Atlas comics. I'm like, what's this? Yeah. And it was a, a sort of an entry point where it's like, wow, okay, I, maybe I can get all these things. I don't know. But yeah, it's, you know, obviously just a different time. Yeah. So uh, one of the first questions we ask, uh, is always, uh, what is your definition of a comic book store besides the point of having comics in it? What are you looking for? What, how do you fill that comic book store? That we have fun be? going into comic stores, getting a sense of community, having a bunch of like-minded people or people who could talk on the topic. Um, obviously, many of us can go through years without having a deep track comic conversation, but it is fun to go into a knowledgeable comic shop and start talking about interests or your latest uh, collecting phase and be able to talk to someone who has equal excitement for it. 
So I think, you know, it's a little haven of people who have this very arcane, hyper-specialized knowledge. And uh, so, you know, it's go going in and meeting like-minded spirits like that is a real thrill. Well, I, and I, I love to tell this story, you know, along what you, what you said, and I don't want to waste any of Brian's time, but I have to, when I saw the movie, The Lost Boys, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know there was such a thing as a comic book store, oh, but yeah. I wanted what Corey Haim and Corey Feldman had. I wanted like, you know, I wanted somebody who knew as much about comic books as I did. And then of course I found out way more than <laughs> I knew. Uh, but, and when I saw that, I was like, that's, and I, I went to seek out a comic book store after that. There's something about yes. going into that comic book store and, and you brought it up, that sense of community and talking to other like-minded. You also learn in, in that comic book store and in those conversations kind of how to have those like discussion conversations because everybody's got a favorite character and everybody's saying, you know, oh, this is why I love this character. Oh, that character's trash. Da, 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 da. So you're having these like almost like argumentative discussions and you're learning how to have those conversations. As, oh, as yeah, a young sure. kid. Well, imagine me. I'm in 1982 at 12 years old. I'm managing a comic book store in Las Vegas. <laughs> and these 30, 40, 50 year olds are walking in asking me questions. And, <laughs> and so you learn that uh, you want to listen a lot. You want to get educated. Uh, you want to provide them some comic book therapy in between. But also, you don't want to be the person that tells them wrong. It's like when someone comes in and says, hey, do you have Red Sonja? And you're like, do I tell him it's Sonia? No, oh, yeah, I have read Sonja, you know, that type yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But right, the, you know, along with that, though, is the worst is when a comic book store steers you away from something you want, though, which happened to me several times back in those sure. early 80s days. You know, the comic book snob. And I, I know Jesse and I are like the furthest thing away from that. It, it's funny you say that. Uh, the comic book snob is alive and real. It's funny. I, I'm not going to name even a state, but right. not too long ago, my wife and I were. We're traveling, and as we do, we'll find out what are the local shops. We go in, and you know, we're very unassuming and, and assume nothing, right? So I was actually kind of looking to you know buy a couple slabs. You know, I'm, I've been going through like many people the pre-code horror phase, and I I was so fascinated by the people that were there. They're kind of having a guys' club, and having customers in was an obstacle and, and a pain. So you know, I was wasn't trying to be too invasive, but I was asking some questions about slabs they had on the wall. It was just really funny. I, friend friend, I were laughing because. We, I also, as you know, I come from the opposite view. I'm just like sell it everything all day, yeah. all the time. So this notion that these guys, it was more like a clubhouse for them and their customers were in the way. I just got a complete chuckle out of that one. And you know what that brings us to, Brian? What's that? Unfiltered Brian. time. <laughs> you always listen to this. Unfiltered time, buddy. Okay. Look. It's, it's, it's stuck. One sec. The most valuable commodity I know of is information. Wouldn't you agree? All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you're scared, go to church. This is not <laughs> the place right now. It We are in unfiltered times, which means that our guests and our host are being notified that... It is truth-telling time, and it is not uh, for the weak of heart. Let's get into it. Brian, you have been so busy lately. Um, I, I Sworn Fest was absolutely amazing. I, I just want to real quickly hit on that. What was it yeah, like? Yeah. I've been to a new, yeah. What was it like uh, for setting up and, and getting Sworn Fest done this year um, it, it, as compared to the last uh, Sworn Fest, the previous Sworn Fest? Anything different what this mean? year? Yeah, what made uh, getting this Sworn Fest 2024 uh, challenging is that we had actually purchased a new building, and part of our promise was to get that thing gutted, rebuilt, and decorated in time to conduct tours. And we did it. But I have to tell you that for a handful of us, that meant six days a week, you, you know, 10, 12 hour days. And we we did, you know, Francisco Polito is, was the overall uh, contractor. Kind of little known, like a whole other element of our household and our family is we we are in real estate, so we uh, we do uh, you know buy, sell, flip, trade, all that kind of stuff. And this building we purchased, it had tenants in it 
Um, all their month to month leases came to an end. That's our previous headquarters, which Francisca was also the general contractor and she and I in a small team decorated it. But yeah, we had to like pull this building apart, put it all together and then get it completely decorated, building a lounge, a production facility, et cetera, et cetera. Good problems for sure. But we completed it at about literally about five, four fifty six PM on Friday and the tours were going to happen Saturday. And that's, that's what it was like. So really right now, Brian, it does feel like life after Sworn Fest, which is still regular busy because I still had my regular publishing job. So, but it was, it's great. Like something like that really calls all of us to that higher purpose of making this thing radical for the Sworn Nation is going to come literally from around the world. And it's their place as much as ours. And we just want them to be, feel proud about what we have all built together in our culture. To me, is the that... I was, oh. you know, it's, it's so funny. He just answered my question. I was ask you, does the culture that you built as you get into, go into this new home headquarters, is, is that really a big, is that like the biggest focus that you're focused on is bringing that culture over? Well, I, well, the building is different than our previous building. It's interesting. It's super gothic-y and uh, yeah, I mean, we do everything kind of in service to the culture and we want to do, yeah, that's, that's the layout of it. Yep. And we just want them to be proud. And what we're doing is kind of a symbol of what we've all done together. So, well, and I mean, I think it would be all remiss to not uh, congratulating you on uh, a big anniversary this week. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, 36 years with uh, your lovely wife. That's true. That's true too. Yeah. Francisca and ah! I, yeah. Yeah. Now it's funny because we it seems like we met on St. Patrick's Day and we did, but it had nothing to do with St. Patrick's Day. Francisca and I both were hired to work on a very low budget film, which turned out to be a post-apocalyptic spaghetti western. And on the first day of shooting, they had no money to go to if it rained to go anywhere. So we actually had a shoot in this tire farm during the rain, and that's where we met. She was the makeup artist, I was the assistant director. And we helped create a little canopy for him to, for her to do the makeup underneath. And there was a an energy and a kismet right off the bat. But I was a metalhead. Like I'm wearing like a Judge Dredd shirt with cutoffs. She's a new age. Yeah, there you go. I was I was that person. <laughs> that's pretty much was, Brian. That's right. And then she's a new wave girl. And uh, the, the the chemistry was real. But I, I think Francisca was probably scratching her head because she's like. Uh, a metalhead like I'm, I'm falling for a metalhead but that's what she'll tell you well you know what's interesting about that uh it's funny you say that because my fave one of my favorite all-time bands is the band called the deftones and the lead sure. singer of the deftones is a huge chino. new wave guy chino, chino. and stefan is the guitar player is a huge metal guy and they yeah. combine to create some of the best sounding music of all time so i imagine that your guys's taste in music through the years is just amazing. I want to know that playlist. I want to know the oh, Polito playlist. We are deep track music nerds. We're I, I love it all, man. Like it's it's all about it. You know, I never was really a sports person. Like I'm into fitness and all stuff. But I was never a sports person. So the stuff that I talk about with great passion would be comic sports and music. So I have a, a a group of friends where we have knocked down drag out convos about music. Like we're still arguing about when Metallica peaked for ten years. We're still arguing about it. And yeah, as far as music is concerned, you know, on a given night, you know, you could hear us. We're playing everything from, you know, trip hop to, you know, death metal. It's all over the place. Yeah, I love that. That's uh, one of the most important things in my life is music also. And I, I, when I was in, I remember when I was a kid, I used to, you know, if I only liked one type of music and that was uh, heavy rock and roll. And if you didn't like that, you, you were, ter you know, you were nothing. And I think we all I, went through that phase. Yeah. And, and as yeah. I got older, like most of us, my love for all types of music just grew yeah. and grew and grew. And yeah. I think that's very important to have that, that love yeah. for all the different types of music. So, uh, Brian, if I can us only see you as an additional member of Deftones. <laughs> <laughs> How was that? I'm sorry. No, go, ahead. go ahead. No, finish. Finish what you're saying. I mean, I love Deftones too. I uh, myself and a bunch of friends went out to Chicago to Riot Fest, uh, really to see Misfits. And one night, Deftones were playing 
as the sun was going down and Rob Zombie was next. And I got to tell you, like, I, I had like the coolest buzz going, plus deaf tones as the sun went down. To oh. the, I will never forget that moment. It was just so. Well, cool. and that's one of the beautiful things about all the art forms is, you know, music, you can remember exactly your favorite time here in this one song. Yeah. You know, comic books, you can remember that moment where you picked up that comic book and were just awestruck. It's it's true. You know, and, and movies, uh, all of these arts hit a different part of your brain, which we only use 10 percent of. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's a matter of striking those, pardon the pun, tones. Yeah. Uh, and, and one of the things that I love about you, Brian, is you have consistently. How many years is Lady Death now or, or Evil Ernie slash Lady Death? Well, 30 years for Lady Death yeah. and even more for Ernie. Ernie was yeah. December 91. So, you know, you look at that and you're like, how is Brian still maintaining that <laughs> that IP? And and on top of that, you know, I, I brought in I brought in my a collection I bought. That's a beauty. Yeah, that's nice. gorgeous right there. A gorgeous you know, one. But you have you have reinvented your own wheel so many times and, and brought out the same product. You know, and I'm not saying you're just replicating, but you you know to keep those things evergreen and then i just i found this in the collection and i was like oh god yeah he even no. did it when he went over to chaos you know yeah you know and, and then just san diego brian and i run into each other over at your booth the first hour of san diego and i had to pick this up that's a beauty because that one just yep. spoke to me <laughs> you know so, so let me let me ask you this how did the term sworn evolve into where it is at now? Well, how did it originate? And then how has it evolved over time? So uh, an evil Ernie super fan named John Bruni in about 1996 coined the term sworn to the black. <coughs> and we all adopted it. And so John gets absolute credit for that. And he's a evil Ernie super fan. We had our first festival of the modern era and we named it Fiend Fest. And, and we, and our promise was to do one and done because we actually didn't intend to do more. And in a sense, we felt that, so this was 2019, in a sense, we felt that that kind of completed an era and that it was time to utterly embrace this new era of coffin. Uh, cause the words like fiend and the, the total, the, the, the longer story, uh, sworn to the black seemed to be belong a little bit to that era in my estimation. So trying to be true to my word, realizing that we're not going to do a bean festival again, said, okay, what are we going to do? And uh, uh, the culture itself just started like boiling that longer piece down to something really simple, sworn, meaning dedicated. And so, and then right around that same time, so about 2020, the word sworn kind of got boiled down to, and we all adopted it. And then, you know, things like sworn festival and just that that mantra sworn meaning dedicated you know we're all one that kind of stuff just came about kind of naturally yeah i don't think there's a bigger fan base for a, a comic a character or a, a brand in comics than this the the sworn nation i don't i don't think there's a bigger well, fan base i mean there's there's not a more rad one no, uh, i look no. i understand that some people have much bigger fan bases but like our fan base is just unique it's uh it's so much more immersive than most people would know. Like there's, there's many layers. There's more, there's a lot of subgroups within the groups. And well, uh, I but, wanted to ask you, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, finish. no, no more to say that, but it's, yeah, it's like uh, we, we ride as one. Yeah. But see, that's what I wanted. To, that's why I was like, Oh yeah, we got to get Brian on. Cause I want to talk about this aspect of it. Cause this is the industry show. Sure. It's about retailing and yeah. all the sub genres below it. Yes. And, uh, one of the things that I've always loved and respected about you, when did you do your first Kickstarter or first was, crowdfund? I'm sorry, your first crowdfund. first one was February 4th, launched in 2014. And we've okay. done, we've completed 40 since, and we've delivered but, on 39. But see, you would think that would then move you out of retail. Uh, and, yeah. and that's the, no, but I, that's the general consensus. Oh, he's going directly to his fans. Yeah. Well, I don't have to is, worry about him. He did his first Kickstarter at a store. Right. Well, yours. <laughs> we know, Jesse. We know. Well, no, that. I'm just I saying know. that he did at a retail store. So. Right. But yeah. you also have a very successful retail program yeah. and a successful 
crowdfund. And I think a lot of the creators, the second they go to one camp or the other, they forget about the other camp and they focus on that one. You've always maintained a strong you know, presence at retail. And then on top of that, your secondary market is so insane. I get, I sell Lady Death on my wall as if it were like 1990s Lady Death as if they were new books. It, it, we're blessed. Uh, uh, but what I'd like to say to that is this, is years ago, like pre-2014, or, or right around 2014, uh, let me illustrate why we're always in shops. Uh, I'm at Planet Comic Con, Kansas City, Great Con. I happen to have whatever is the latest story fresh out of a Kickstarter, like we shipped everything, so now I have some extra copies. And those would be available in advance than they would to be the comic shops. A guy comes up, totally the person you'd paint as our customer. Cool long hair, purgatory t-shirt. We get to talking, and I'm like, dude, I got just the thing for you. I got the next chapter. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Dude, I'm looking forward to it, but I'm buying it at my comic shop. And I'm like, I get it. I respect that. And that, what that says is that my belief is that people purchase based on convenience and habit. And so the comic shop market has always been a great market for that. And uh, like you said, Dennis, our numbers are fairly consistent in that market. You know, we're not like one, number one, two or three, but we still are super consistent. We're very profitable and people, I believe strongly that people buy based on their convenience and comic shops are convenience to many people. Crowdfunding is convenient to other people. And then the other big category for us is just our direct to customer promotions. And it's also relative to their experience. It's convenient because it's based on access or lack thereof. Well, I think one of the other things that I wanted to talk to you about, and we segued it perfectly with the 7-Eleven Slurpee Cup and the spinny rack at 7-Eleven, uh, the industry, which mm -hmm. we talk about here often, yeah. uh, they ceded ground in the late 80s and early 90s to one particular devil, the video game. Mm -hmm. And we lost, at least by my count, three generations of future comic book readers because we didn't see them dedicating their lives to video games. And there's this one crazy maniac who in the last couple months announced he's <laughs> going to finally video games. We are. It's true. And this is how we win back. This is the way we win back people. Tell us about this. So Lady Death Demonicron is being made by an Australian based company called Art of Play. Art of Play has a background of over 10 years working with Nickelodeon, building games for them, ranging from Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So they have quite a pedigree. They also have an appetite for 90 side-scrolling punch-em-ups. And an artist who works with Coffin Comics, Anthony Spey, was and is working with Art of Play as art director on another side-scroller they're doing called The Phantom, based on the King Features uh, character, The Phantom. They, uh, Anthony brought us together. We met, we vibed instantaneously. And beginning last September, late August, we concocted the notion of doing this particular game, which would be canon to the Lady Death storyline. It is an actual story. It's crafted by myself, my co-writer, Mike McLean, and Ash Nichols of Art of Play. And it's, it's, it's 15 layers of action. It's a story that is in our continuity. And it's, it's the whack, the crazy, hard R-rated Lady Death game people want. And it, it's going to look like a comic book come to life. Absolutely. And, and the thing is, is, you know, I tell people, you know, I had this very unique moment where a bunch of my uh, employees wanted to take the uh, go home early so they could go wait at uh, GameStop at midnight to pick up this movie, this game called Marvel Ultimate Alliance. Yeah. And I was like, okay, fine. You play your fucking video game. <laughs> and they were going to, They, I think one of them showed up late to work the next day because they stayed up all night playing it. <laughs> but that next day, I saw a 15-year-old kid come in and go, where are your Deadpool comics? That's cool. Oh, oh, back, back over there in the dollar boxes. And then like later that day, another kid came in. Deadpool? <clears throat> And then I'm like, okay, something's up with this Deadpool. What is it? Oh, oh, oh yeah, he's on the opening. He He's one of your first characters you get to play at. That was the first time most kids heard of Deadpool. Yeah. 
And yeah. so there, it, I, I saw firsthand the power of a video game driving people into a comic book store. And I tell Rob Liefeld that all the time. <laughs> Our hope, too, is you'll notice that by choice, we're not going for the conventional, the hyper slick 3D look. We want the game to be a bridge to comics because it'll look like a comic come to life. Because we love comics. We understand the, that comics are valid. And this particular approach hopefully makes it easier for people to say, I played the game and I liked how it looked. Oh, wow, here's a comic book. Here's more stories based on it. Um, yeah, we've been hard at work on the, the layers of it. There's some fascinating morality uh, lines and transitions in it. I think people, uh, you know, people get at the bare minimum two and a half hours of play if they could defeat it, you know, win it. And if uh, they're clever, there are unlocks that make the game up to five hours in length. Wow. I was able to uh, go to the panel for this at Sworn Fest, and it was one of the best panels uh, of the weekend, in my opinion, because the fans uh, were asking so many great questions, and they're the questions that you would expect from you know Sworn fans. And one of the great questions was asking about music in the game and what the music was going to be like. Can you talk about the music in the game? Yeah, so we're, I mean, we're taking it seriously. So the music is going to range from a metal industrial soundtrack, metal classical, depending on the moment. So, and we also intend to announce voiceover actors for, for the main characters, but it'll be very unconventional. We're actually looking at voiceover uh, for the characters from people in the world of uh, uh, heavy metal and oh, rock and roll music. Wow, that would be awesome. Yeah. That would be great. Very cool. So, I have a question about cover artists. Sure. Tell me, it, because you know we all know about Cop and Comics, Lady Death, and and cover art. How much of your cover artists? What your relationship is? It a lot of personal is there business and what's the because you have extreme retention with your cover artists how does that all formulate in your plans i mean coffin com ultimately coffin comics mission statement is to create fun and excitement for people in the domain of rock and roll inspired comics so as you know jesse we do take it seriously so that means we have to spread that throughout everywhere so it's not only for our customer it's internally for the coffin comics crew and it's in our relationship to the artists now, in a previous lifetime, I actually used to work as an independent contractor in film and video. And you know, you'd render a service, and what was common in that world is you'd get paid 30 days later for your service, the, the work that you did for this company. And then frequently, I would find myself having to track down that money. And it was a bad feeling because it was I, I had rendered the work, but now I'm tracking down the money that's owed me for my own work. It was a creepy feeling. So one of the things that we we like to do is really treat people how we like to be treated ourselves. So in terms of our cover artists, et cetera, everybody gets comps, as you know, and they're usually initial. We're hoping that those create a higher value for people, but we just try to be uh, in everything with coffin. We try to be trustworthy and try to be transparent. You know, I was a younger business person at one time. I made a lot of mistakes, a lot of failures, and I learned, and I like to think that as time goes on, I get to apply what I've learned. And so I think you kind of get max, you get, maximum return from transparency and trust so yeah these you know in my case like money is not at the forefront of the motivation of what it is that we do it's making comics having fun making beautiful work that people can really enjoy and delight on so it's incumbent upon me to create an atmosphere among our culture and our culture of independent contractors where they're happy to work with us that they are getting paid what we agreed upon that the work itself is playful and we're trying to inspire ourselves to hit a home run every time. So that's kind of where we're coming from as opposed to like, um, you know, we're working hard. I mean, we do a budget and all that stuff, but it's like, you know, it's all a matter of dollars and cents and what your value is to me. It's more like, this is collaborative. I also think like you take a look at the retention of our core creative teams. For yeah. example, Bill Gomez, he's nine years in on La Muerta. Um, Diego Bernard, by his own choice, you know, re-signed recently with Coffin Comics long term. You know, so he's on his sixth year in, inside Lady, uh, Lady Death Interior Artist. And many of our cover artists, Don McTague, 10 years. David Harrigan, 13 years. Richard Ortiz, 
18 years. Wow. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just something that we try to create, create a fun atmosphere for people and, and communicate consistency. Because, you know, as you probably know from, you know, if I was to contrast things like big two, it's like, you know, as soon as you're not useful to those guys, <coughs> argue, that's my, how I see it from the outside looking in. And, you know, I don't know really who runs those places anymore. I can't quite tell if anyone has a background in comics. But again, I'm not trying to toot the horn, but I think most of you guys know in my soul, I love comic books. So I want to make more beauty and fun and excitement with comics. So hopefully that answers your question. That's the most important part is having, to me, in, a, in creators and publishers is, do they have that love for comics? You know, yeah. the community, the comics themselves. That's so important to me. And I feel like we, we lately, um, in the last maybe five, five years, we've, we've seen a lot of grifters in, in our world because there was a lot of money in, in comic books for a period of time there for yeah. people who haven't been, didn't, maybe didn't even know that comic books were selling like they were. Um, yeah. So it's very interesting. But I want to hint on one artist that uh, I've absolutely fell in love with because of Coffin Comics. And it was absolutely amazing to see him come out this year to <laughs> Sornfest. And that's Mike Chrome. This artist, oh, absolutely unbelievable. It was, he's bananas. Yeah, his stuff is great. I mean, I guess I met Mike Chrome, Don McTagg, Ebass, like that whole uh, group of folks just on the road doing conventions. And yeah, Chrome's, what can you say? Look at him. He's, he, yeah, uh, everything we get in from Mike Chrome is a delight. I mean, imagine too, my life guys, like most mornings we wake up and we have something to look at in the inbox and it's great. Like there's him working on a beautiful pirate lady death. Yeah, stuff's insane. Yeah. Yeah, I love, I love Mike Chrome. It's uh it really is a delight to open up the mailbox and get whatever the heck is coming out of his mind. And you know, what we might do, depending on a given chapter and theme, I usually just describe broadly a theme uh, of what I'm looking for. We might have a story driven uh, comic book edition and I might give that to the interior artist and that might be more story centric. But generally, maybe I'll describe something that's evocative so that they can kind of step in and come up with their own ideas. I find that that most artists respond to that, especially the Mike Chromes, the Don McTaggs, the Ebasses. They, you know, have a wonderful, beautiful, wild imagination. And, you know, why should I try to corral these wild stallions? Just <laughs> let them, you know, gallop into the infinity. Hell yeah. So, so I wanted to, I wanted to touch on while we have you here, because we had last week, I don't know if you saw last week's episode, fairly controversial topic sure. that kind of really bled into your world. And one of the things Jesse and I really talk about is our personal uh, IP, our personal brands. Yeah. And uh, it happened to you and you handled it like, I don't think I've seen anybody else handle it. Uh, tell us a little about the, the controversy of cosplay variants, quote unquote, and, and how you dealt with it. So, well, okay. The way I understand federal trademark and copyright law, you use it or you lose it. So it's incumbent upon you, the, the property owner, to protect it. So I do think there is a difference. This is speaking for myself. There, there is a difference in my personal stance for, on an homage and then um, a cosplay cover that actually just matches the intellectual property. Right. Particularly if it turns into a print or it turns into a comic book, I actually have no choice except to pursue it to the full extent of the law allowable. And, and that's what we do every time. And, you know, you, on occasion you'll see it, but many times you don't. Right now in the digital age, I am so sad to say that, you know, we pursue weekly because it could be things like people making statues with ZBrush and offering them on eBay. But what we do is we're, we're like... There's a, there's a program on eBay where you're a known intellectual property owner and it reduces the reporting time. And we have that same sort of thing on other platforms, on Etsy, Threadless, TeePublic, Amazon. But the stuff keeps coming up, but we keep protecting it. So I guess really the message is that um, we take zero pleasure in it, but Coffin Comics will protect its intellectual property at all times to the fullest extent of the law uh, allowable. But that's the whole story. And, and that's the stand in the matter. Um, I think there's difference. Like, uh, I, I also do homages, but I'm trying to do matches. I'm not saying it's better, but well, for example, like, um, the old Marvel, 
Yeah, so for example, right, there you have it. There's the wizard number one. And the wink wink there is we're taking what was originally Spider-Man and making it Lady Death, wink wink. And I guess I guess in our culture that's generally accepted. Whereas if we kind of stage that same character as if we own it in something that ha bears yeah. no resemblance to it, I guess that's the stuff that we personally will always take action well, on. And, and Marat actually put on here, and I could barely read it, but it says Marat after Todd McFarlane. We always do an attribution yeah, absolutely. Credit. And yeah. and there's so much, there's so much of the goodwill if you do that in your wink, wink, nudge, nudge. But when these people just outright say, oh, you know, it's really hot right now is Lady Death. I'm going to make my character look like Lady Death. And, uh, and, but they don't even make it look, if they just draw Lady Death, you know, it's just like. Right. Uh, yeah. And that, I, I totally do not recommend people to do that. Um, we have a long history of protecting our marks. We just don't think it's worth their time. They don't understand our longevity and our staying power in legal circumstances. We, we've been, you know, I've been with the same legal team literally for 30 plus years. And, you know, we will, we'll just dig in and stay with it for all time. It just, it usually just wears people out. Right. And you might get away with that doing it for Marvel because you might be the buzzing of flies to Vigo. But when you do it to, you know, somebody like you who literally has the sworn army, you know, and 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 they literally just went ape shit. I, I, the army went after her like like yeah. Kiss Army would go after people. Well, they take it personally. I think yeah. that's that's the difference between right. and comics and, and Lady Death fans. There's a. There's a sense of uh, responsibility, yeah. actually, to be the Lady Death police, I guess, for us big Lady Death fans. So, Yeah, and there's even, like, within the Swarm Nation, there's organizations within the organizations, and we just take care of matters. Yeah. 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 Yep. That love for yeah, it. But anyway, is... I want to emphasize to everybody, please just don't do it. We take no pleasure at all in defending our mark, and we will. It's, it's unpleasant for everybody. So just don't do it. Go cause, go like homage something else. Cause if not, then I just got to come after you. What, yeah. There's a question from uh, somebody in the chat that asks, uh, do you have any horror or sci-fi crossovers that you would like to see uh, doing with some of your IPs with lady death or, or any other characters out there that you would love to do? I've had some dream crossovers. I haven't done a heck of a lot about it. You know, it was wonderful to cross over lady death with zombie tramp. You know, uh, Dan Mendoza, I think he is a phenomenal publisher and a unique talent, and he really took that one on, and the work is phenomenal. It's great. I guess on my wish list of fun collaborations would be – I've always liked the Top Cow universe, so I would like yeah. my characters to cross over. It would be fun to do, like, you know, Witchblade, Darkness, Cyber Force, Aphrodite X, uh, Magdalena. I really like those characters. So uh, I don't know how – you know, uh, both both us guys, us and Top Cow, kind of danced around that notion. Um that would be kind of fun. Uh, there's some dream ones. I don't know that they would be possible. Um, what other ones? I don't. You know, it's interesting. Yeah, you know, all that takes a lot of work, as you can imagine. Like I used to do the licensed comics, and and I've done crossovers. We crossed over with Vampirella. We did cross over with uh, Medieval Witchblade at one time. And even in the best of circumstances, there's a lot of work involved. So yeah. what's been really pleasurable and kind of unique in comics, and I think you guys can appreciate it, is that. We actually been launching our own new characters and they're embraced. Now there have been times in my career in my life where I could like try as I might, just cannot connect, right? So I'll try stuff and it doesn't. So to be in this era where right now we could introduce a character like Chaotica or Lady Satanus and that to be a two hundred thousand dollar Kickstarter, I completely realize the blessing that it is. And if I could repeat it for a couple more years. It's awesome. So that's why this year we're doing new stories. We're doing a supernatural Western named Lady Gunfighter. You know, if people are willing to listen, I would love to do a Western. And we're, we're doing a, like an ultra-violent, male-dominated comic with heart and comedy, and that's Mike Morg. So we're taking those kind of chances. So it's fun to be rewarded that people will read our stuff on its own. Uh, and the crossovers, while they could be fun in theory, sometimes in practice, they just wind up being a little complicated. Yeah. Now, all of that being said, I will tell you that something will be announced for later this year that is quite thrilling and does require 
cooperation among several creators everybody knows. And I cannot say anything more because I am not authorized. But something's coming, mm. and it's wicked. <laughs> All right, look, can I ask one more question before we uh, lose yeah, Brian? Yep. Yeah. How did the collab go with uh, Rob Liefeld? Uh, for me, I thought it was great. I mean, no, no, know, I mean, how did it come about? Uh, so, I am a Rob Liefeld fan. I like his work, and I believe that I have certain feelings which I will express to you about Rob and his work and his place in comics. And I just thought it would be rad. So, of course, Rob Michaels is a pal. And I said, look, not for nothing, man, can you ask Rob? So uh, uh, Marat did ask Rob on my behalf. It took a little while. And, and Rob said yes. And we had, we had met maybe briefly through the years. Like I've met probably every image founder and spent some time with them, but not Rob. Um, so we did come together. And I did have a chance to express myself uh, about to Rob about what I think he did for comics. And I will tell each and everyone listening what I think that Rob did for comics. So towards the end of the 80s into the 90s, comics were getting a little stale. And this young upstart was featured in a Levi's 501 commercial uh, about him doing this comic called X-Force. With the hottest director on the planet. Who was the director of the- Spike uh, Lee. Oh, Spike right, Lee directed right, right. that, so, yeah. Right, so Spike Lee was directing it. and. You know, I think comics were getting kind of stale. And I think that combined with his approach on X-Force in particular, which is kind of like the first time you see superheroes as a paramilitary force in the energy, the excitement and the layouts. I thought Rob was kind of like leading the forefront of a new era of comic book creators that felt kind of like, quote unquote, us, the reader. Like, it, and yet they were bigger than life. So I did get a chance to express that to him. And I think he appreciated it. And he's also, you know, watched what Coffin Comics has been able to accomplish because comics are wild, man. There's many ways to skin the cat and we, you know, we skin the cat differently. So I thought coming together for this collaboration was cool. I also think it's funny, like we're looking at this particular version, but there's another version that is super bloody. And I'm laughing to myself because Rob Liefeld's cover for Lady Death is the bloodiest cover we've published in like five years, for sure. Yeah. I actually didn't expect that when I got the work in, like, you know, we... We agreed on the layouts and all that stuff, but then boom, he came in with all this blood. I'm just laughing. Yep. Well, the reason I brought that up is, uh, should we just announce it now, Brian? No, What's we that? can we can talk about it later. We no, can talk about it later. No, okay. yeah, no, 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 yeah. that's uh, right on. Yeah, yeah. peace. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I, I think I think it's cool that we've had a couple weeks in a row um, where we've had like this really cool inside look to what other creators feel about other creators and I, I love to hear um, that inside baseball talk between you guys because you guys don't all know each other and we don't realize that as collectors and it's yeah. cool to hear those stories like that so oh, thanks for that it's wild as a comics fan to run into folks you know creators that you admire that you you know you've never had a chance to talk to like many years ago this is going back to 1999 I finally got to meet Frank Miller and you know what he meant to me, his work, right? Like reading Daredevil as it came out, and then of course Dark Knight, Ronin. You know how he progressed. You know meant meant the world to me. You know it meant that the comics seemed to be before that for kids, and that was certainly how it was looked upon when I was a reader. But Miller and guys like Alan Moore kind of made it kind of cool and hip and legitimate that you could <laughs> like this stuff. And obviously they were really pushing the boundaries in every way, shape, or form. So finally got to meet Miller initially and could hardly speak around him. you know francisca's you know just talking it up with miller because it's just another person to her but to me i'm sort of like it's frank miller you know since I, then go ahead no 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 you know, since then i have met him and yeah. you know i've had a more relaxed conversation but yeah meeting frank I, miller was one of the big ones so can i tell everybody the first time we met or how we met sure so uh so i had been a lady deaf fan forever right so i opened up this store in glendale arizona and I'm talking to a store owner and he's like, how come you have all this lady death up on your walls, but you're not selling? I go, oh, I'm a big Brian Polito fan and blah, 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 blah. So two days before opening, the phone rings and guy on the phone, he goes, hey, this is uh, Brian Polito. I know you're opening up your store. I'd like to do a signing at your store. I'm like, yeah, okay. All right, whatever, dude. I'm thinking these mother effers are messing with me, right? So Brian's trying to pitch doing a sign. I'm like, yeah, you know, 
maybe six months from now and blah, 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 blah. And, and so Brian starts to say something. Go, okay, dude, I got to go. So I hang up on him. <laughs> Literally three minutes later, the owner of Atomic Comics, uh, Mike Malvey, calls me and goes, dude, do you know how long it was for me to set up Brian to call you to do a store sign? I go, that wasn't <laughs> Brian Polito. And so after he says that, I said, well, I'm not calling him back. I'm embarrassed now. <laughs> and Brian called me back laughing on the phone. And he was the first person to do a sign at my store. But the funny part of about it was, and Brian, I don't know if you're going to remember this. We were so nervous about it that we had two bathrooms. So we clean, we <laughs> emptied one bathroom out and put everything in this other bathroom. You could not get in this bathroom, right? And this one's clean. <laughs> so I hear this table falling. Brian's in, in this bathroom that you cannot get to the toilet, but finds a way to get in there and walks out. And I'm just thinking, we cleaned that other bathroom for brian oh. yeah he goes oh shit stuff brian you cannot get out but that was my first experience <laughs> with him and uh, uh for being a comic book fan becoming a retailer uh brian is has been rock star with me since the beginning so i can't thank you enough about that just Ride or to die, baby. yeah yeah well, right we've on. got the game coming out. Uh, yep. Kickstarter starts April 24th, so make sure you guys go check that out. Uh, CoffinComics.com uh, will all your needs right there. Sign up for the text list, and um, it's yeah. it's amazing stuff. What else you you got going on coming up soon that uh, the people need to know about? April 24th, Lady Death the Monochron game goes live on Kickstarter. Not long thereafter, Wednesday, May 8th. It's the next chapter of our giant storyline celebrating Lady Death's 30th anniversary. It's La Muerta, Lady Death, Inferno. This one's for all the goods. La, La Muerta versus Lady Death. I think La Muerta might have really figured out a way to actually kill Lady Death. She actually holds her responsible for all the terrible things that are happening in our storyline. I don't know how it turns out, but tune in on May to see what's next. Not long thereafter, in June... Lady Gunfighter by myself, Mike McLean, illustrated by Joel Gomez and colored by Hedwin Zalvadar and lettered by our veteran letterer, Marshall Dillon, who's lettered every Coffin Comics new stories. At, at that point, 43 new stories, at least 48 pages to 56 pages. Guys, it never ends. There's always something. There's no slowing down on Lady Death's 30th anniversary year. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brian. We appreciate you and uh, can't wait to have you back again, man. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, man, are you I serious? Gotta... I am not going to get you on this. I'm gonna I... be back. Look, I, oh, first of all, and I, I will be hitting you up to do a store signing uh, because I feel like I'm the only one that hasn't had a store signing with Brian over here. I'm retired. I'll come out and drink with you. Okay, yeah. but you, you have to check out my record store and video game store. Sounds like fun. Absolutely. All right, right. On, guys. Thank you so much. Appreciate your friendship and uh, just love comics because comics are life. Appreciate you, Brian. Adios. There you go, Later, bye. Guys. Thank Take you so care. much. Yeah, he's the best, man. That was yeah. awesome. He absolutely is. Yeah. And it, it, in my 30 years on the circuit, you know, 40 years of co collecting and reading comics, 30 years on the circuit, 20 years of owning retail. Brian's never asked me for anything. He is, you know, except, you know, like when he called me for the 7-Elevens. He's like, oh, no, no, how much do I have to pay you? I go, dude, just send me some comics. I don't care. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you never, he never, he just is Brian. And you support yeah. him because he's Brian. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Love yeah, of I, comics, I, man. I, yeah, I, I've told this people, and I, uh, I really mean this, that when COVID hit, I had three people come to me. Uh, to say, what can we do to help you? And Brian was one of the first people to call and say, what what can I do to, to help you? And as a retailer, um, we are looking for those relationships that matter more than buying more Marvel DC books, yeah. right? Uh, and I think uh, over the 15 years I've had the store, 42 years selling books, um, there's there's certain people in this industry you can count on. There's not a lot of them. I'm in Taylor right now. Uh, I put up ten fingers. Trust me, it's not ten fingers. You can you can honestly say this is a good friend that's looking out for yeah. my best interest. So to have an on our show is is just an honor. 
Uh, and he, like I said, he's a, just a, like Dennis said, he's just a cool cat yeah. uh, that that you kind of want to have a beer with. So, well, yeah. what I what I like about this show uh, for me, and I bring it up all the time, is that that in, inside baseball stuff. I get to sit back and I get to learn and, and hear from people that are in the industry and how to make it in this industry and all the different parts of this industry that go together. Um, and our next guest is a perfect example of that. Dennis, you want to bring him in? Yeah. So uh, I met this gentleman 14 years ago. Um, he is one of the hardest working indie comic creators, in my opinion, in this business. Uh, he's got a persona and he's got a real life and I've gotten to meet both of them. Uh, and it's Dirk Manning, everybody. Uh, I, we like to call him Dirk Motherfucking Manning. <laughs> DMFM, what's going on, guys? How you doing? So, Thank you for coming on. Good, good, good. I'm gonna fix my camera. So let me let me do a little bit of more introduction, and then you you'll take over for that. So All right. my mentor, uh, unbeknownst to me, in 2010 became Gary Reed. Gary created Caliber. He basically uh, created the second coming of the creator owned indie comic movement caliber comics the crow he was bendis's first job when he would just open up his rolodex he would just start pulling out all these stops he was yeah. the first cfo of mcfarland toys for a while or the president of mcfarland toys and we're going through our comps for this little show that i put on in detroit called detroit fanfare and he's like, we're going through the comps. And we, we were a new show, so we only had like 20 comp tables that we could give out. And he's like, hey, uh, what about this Dirk Manning guy? I'm like, hey, Dirk Manning, he's, he's kind of the gimmick guy, right? He's, and if you see right over Dirk's shoulder there, he had the hat and he wore the little thing over his face. And, yep. and I'm like, he goes, no, no, yeah, I, that's just kind of this persona he has. But he's actually legitimately really good. And I go, yeah, let's do it. And that's, I got introduced to him. And... I'm like, oh, you're not the, the, the top hat guy. He goes, no, I wore that like two times. And go ahead and tell us the rest of the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was one of those things where it's funny because, <laughs> and, and Dennis, you'll be amongst these people. And uh, people swear that like, oh, I saw Dirk and he had like the top hat and the scarf and all this stuff. And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, I, I, I've worn that two times ever. Only if I'm ever doing a signing on Halloween night, I will dress up as the Dirk Manning persona. And that's it. And Dennis and I had an argument one time about this. Like, no, you were at the show and you were dressed up like that. I'm like, I promise you I was not. I, I, I just saw his, yeah. yeah, that right there, right? Right. You know, it's like it's like like two, maybe three times ever I've dressed like that, like for any public thing. And it's always on Halloween. But uh, yeah, Gary was uh became a a mentor of of mine as well. And it was one of those things where um, Gary putting me over to you, Dennis, and, and Detroit Fanfare was was a really big deal to me. Quick, quick aside too, if I can just geek out for a second, Dennis, I just sent you something on Facebook. I don't know if you got it. Oh no! You check it. your Facebook. You're really going to get a kick out of what I just sent you. Um, Brian Polito, back when I was self publishing, because Jesse, you were talking about what a great guy Brian. Oh wow! I'll, I'll uh, send yeah, this to yeah. you, Brian. I'll okay. send this to you. Okay. Yeah, I. When I was first self-publishing, Brian Polito wrote an introduction to one of my basically self-published comic books back in the day. Didn't know me from Adam, but I first met Brian in 1995, and I just sent Dennis the picture, <laughs> at a comic book store signing, and we all, a bunch of us all went out afterwards. So there's 1995, Dirk Manning, me, Brian, and Steve, me and Brian and the long-haired crew, and, you know, Steve just looking dapper right. as he did. Steve Hughes, everybody. Steve Hughes, yeah, the the uh, original artist on Lady Death, a lot of the learning stuff. But that's us back in nineteen ninety five. That's awesome. And we went out to we went out to a metal club afterwards. We had an absolutely great time. Uh, Brian was a huge inspiration of mine just because he was out there just doing the thing right in his comics. He had such passion in them and things like that. So in the early 2000s, when I started my career, because this is my, I'm now entering my 21st year as a published comic book creator, but when I was just getting started, uh, Brian actually wrote an introduction to one of my comics for me. 
and was just the coolest dude about it. And then years later, getting to know Brian kind of as a peer and things like that, you know, from going to the metal bar with him uh, after a comic book store signing to that, and then bringing him back in to do an introduction for my books again later. Awesome, awesome dude. Brian is just one of the best guys in the industry. So, um, But it's what I've been saying is guys like you and guys like Brian, you, you came out from this indie level mm -hmm. and you focused on your fans. You focused on your fans, but also great relationships with retailers. If you pull that picture back up, what store was that? Uh, that was JC's Comics in Toledo, Ohio. That's and I, I thought it was the old JC's. Right, that the so, old JC's, right? Yeah, yeah, the old yeah. old old one. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know that I, I think he was at Motor City right before that. Um, I, I want to say this linked into a Motor City appearance. Um, that, that's very possible. Yeah, yeah. but I just remember you know, saw Five Story Fall afterwards at the at the Crow Bar and stuff like that. It was just it was just a it was a great night. But you know, you guys slug it out and you build your little niche. You don't try to jump other people's shit. You you kind of just stay right in your zone. You expand mm -hmm. your zone. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell tell everybody first of all what is a comic book store. Uh, aside from just being a place that sells comic books for you. Yeah, Brian kind of stole it earlier uh, when he said a sense of community, but that's a big part of it. You know, uh, the comic book shop, first and foremost, is about community. But I think past the, the sense of community, because I think Brian already talked about that, a good comic book store, and, and you guys touched on this a little bit too, is a place of discovery, right? I, I think it's so important when you can go to a comic book store and you talk to the staff, and, and rather than them turning you off to things, they're turning you on to things, right? Uh, the reason that I read, uh, I was introduced to The Watchmen. The, the first three comics I ever read, right? Seriously, I started getting into comics. Three of the first comics I read were The Crow by James Obar, uh, Watchmen, and Dark Knight Returns. And Watchmen was like foisted into my hands by the comic book store owner because I was looking at the cover and so he's like, oh, dude, he was like, here, all 12 issues, just 12 bucks, just take them and appreciate it. This is one of the best things ever, right? Things like that. And to this day, whenever I'm out on the road, whenever I'm in a new town, I love going to the comic shop and I, and I want to buy something new, buy something that I normally would not read. And I go and I like talk to the store owners. I'm like, hey, what, what's something cool I should check out? Yeah, I said, I'm into horror stuff. I'm a horror guy, but I just... Just like what, what? What's your jam? And you discover so much cool stuff that way. And and I think the comic book stores that you see right now thriving and surviving because we all know it. It's tough right now in comics. It, it's tough for creators. It's tough for store owners. I mean, it's tough all around. But the stores that are thriving are the ones that are introducing people to work, whether it be with what you're doing, Dennis, which is with something you're know, reintroducing people to classic comics. Jesse, obviously, you're a huge advocate for comic books and stuff like that as well, and what you do and, and things like that. But going to a store where you can go in and you can go to the owner and maybe they'll, you know, some people will, will foist on you like their favorite thing. But when they ask you, like, what do you like? Right. What kind of stuff do you like? I say, well, I'm a really big horror guy or, you know, I, I like this writer, I like this creator. And they say, OK, well, check this out. To me, that is what the definitive comic book store is about. That and again, creating that sense of community. Right. Whether it be through you know, your Wednesday crowd, whether it be through events and signings, whether it be through, you know, sorry to say the bad word, the F word free comic book day, whatever it is, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, whatever it is that you can, you can create a sense of community there. That's and, and just turn people onto the medium and, and grow the audience through what we do. That's, that's what it's all about to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's great because there's a great story I had today. I hadn't gone to the store in a year in Tampa. And the second I walked in, the guy runs to his back room. He goes, oh, I got something for you. I got something for you. And he brings me out these two big folders. He goes, I, I've, I bought these like two days after you last came, which was a year ago, right? And mm -hmm. he comes out, and it's two folders of Lady Death stuff, right? And it's, it's that type of relationship that you're building when you walk into a store. And that store owner has to choose what type of relationships he has. Uh, does that customer walk out and he doesn't think about them again? Or has he created a brand in that guy's head to come back? And when he comes in, oh, yeah, that's right. I don't remember every customer, but I can get a 
pretty good gist of when someone walks in and, and what they like. Do you, when you walk in, do you say you're a writer? Do you say you're a publisher? Or do you go in as a comic book fan? I go in as a comic book fan. Okay. In fact, and again, you know, I'm going to, Dennis and I go way back. So I'm going to use this example. Yeah. Uh, the second year at Detroit Fanfare, I got to the show early and I was like in a baseball hat and a t-shirt. I'm like, hey, Dennis. And Dennis was busy, you know, getting ready to set yeah. up the show. He's sure. like, yeah. I go, Dennis. And f finally, I lift, I like kind of like had to take my baseball. I'm like, Dennis, it's me. He was, oh my God. So I, I'm, I'm really, um, I don't want to say intentionally stealthy about it, but I, I'm not going in there for any other reason but to right. be a fan. Sure. Well, you're kind of like Henry Cavill wearing the Superman shirt under the giant Batman versus <laughs> Superman banner, yeah. and nobody in Times Square recognized him. Yeah. Right. You know? but, and he was I'll wearing the glasses. He's wearing the Clark Kent glasses. Right. But I'll tell you what's funny, Jesse, is, and, and I swear to you this is true, during COVID, wearing the mask, I would get recognized in, like, my local grocery store. What I never would before. Sure. But wearing the mask, because people are only used to yep. seeing pictures like this, you're covered right. up or something like that. It was the damnedest thing, and, and I'm not making this up. I had more people stop me like, are you, are you Dirk Manning, the comic book guy? And I'm like, yeah, you know, you know. but... Um, no, I, I go to the comic book stores as fans first and, and talk to them. And, you know, if it's a store that seems interested and open and we're hanging off, and you know, you can tell the culture of a store. Oh, right yeah, sure, way. sure. And, and I might say, well, you know, hey, I, I publish from SourcePoint Press. You know, if I'm back in the area, I'd like to set something up or even, you know, send you, you know, copies of the books, set up a signing or something like that. But I, I go in as a, as a fan first, you know. Um, I try I keep my work life and my, my personal life very, very separate, very, you know, siloed but uh, i love going to a comic book store as a fan right when i'm going there to work i'm there to work if i'm not working i want to go in there as a fan just appreciate it and enjoy it because you know people react to that differently too you know if they know you're a professional they know you work oh yeah there. sure yeah i they walked into a store today and i literally walked in and said this store is small i said this to shannon when we walked in i said this store is small and it sucks i can't find anything and we're checking out and it's six hundred dollars right because that store owner came over and said all right first time in the store let me show you everything let me show you how this works right and right. i was like oh i get it now and uh, so it's it's very interesting to hear uh, stories as as people walk in in this industry in any level uh mm -hmm. and how we perceive it because as a retailer we are walking in to say hey what do they do good that i can bring back to my right. store, right? Yeah. Well, you, yeah, and and that's the thing too, you know. Uh, and I know you touched on this a little with Brian as well, but as a comic creator and as a comic creator who, you know, I mean, I would uh, my first big publishing gig was with Image Comics, and then I went over, yeah, there's samples of a bunch of my work, and then you know, doing uh, right or wrong with with uh, Gary Reed over at Caliber, and yeah, then which, I worked, hold on, let me pause you for a second. Yeah. Right or wrong is by everybody's account the definitive how to write indie comics. Um, I, I have you. sold so many copies of it. Jesse has sold so many copies yeah. of it. Uh, you've probably started more people than you probably can count on their road to being like you. Thank you. Well, I, you know, I always tell people there's no one path, but here was my path. You know, right yeah. or wrong, was that was a column I started at Newsarama. And uh, when I published the original edition of that book with Caliber, with Gary, uh, well, the only times ever I, I agreed to publish a book up front on a handshake deal. I'm a contract monster. You know, it's like have it in writing. I used to say that contracts maintain friendships over 20 years. Of work. That's, that's not the case, but at least contracts can make your deal a little more enforceable. Yeah. Yeah. There it is. yeah. And, and what's so funny about what you just said is not many people really until about 10 years ago really had contracts for anything. It was a really a handshake business world. Uh, so it's funny that you, you came in with that contract mode because I remember saying, hey, where's the contract on this exclusive? Oh, don't worry about it. Yeah, you oh, we know, got you. We got yeah, you. yeah. And then six yeah. months later, it's like, wasn't that supposed to come out like four months ago? You know? Yeah. Money money makes people funny, you sure. know? And, and, and it's a thing. And, you know, um, again, I, I hate to keep quoting Brian, but, you know, he talked about it as well, you know, about how the comic business is ultimately a business. And I, I'm very fortunate to be doing this independently for 21 years now. And 
when we start when when I started, I started like everybody. It was like it was like being like a punk rock band, right? You know, it's like we're we're making you know Nightmare World, like Dennis was showing up a minute ago. That started as an online comic series. We were one of the OGs of online comics. That series was one of the first fully realized comic books online, and there were no contracts because there was no money. It was free. But I promised everybody. I promised every creator. I said, if we ever make money on this you will make money on it first. And years later, and I want to say it was 2018 with Devil's Due when we did the Nightmare World Omnibus. And for the first time, like the, the, the book was truly overly profitable, right? It was like, not me just out there slinging books at shows and things like that, but we finally really had like a definitive chunk of money come out of this. I went back to every artist and some of them I hadn't talked to at that point in like 10 years. And I hunted them down and I said, hey, I made you a deal here's a contract. I want to pay you money. And I paid every artist. And one of the artists totally dropped out the face of the earth, wasn't on social media and things like that. It wasn't until another five years after that, that I finally found him again, because I found an old email somewhere and I checked it. And the guy, and I swear to God, was literally digging ditches out there. And I said, hey, man, I said, you did this one Nightmare World story, you know, back in the day, and I want to pay you for it. At the end of the day, this is still a business. And, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you that everybody I've ever worked with, I'm still friends with. I mean, that I, I wish that could be the case, but it's not. But at least I can look myself in the mirror, and if the mirror doesn't break, and say, you know, I have treated everyone from a business perspective very fairly. And contracts are just a part of that. And and people that don't want to engage in a contract, that's a huge red flag. Yeah. Because, again, you can fight anything, right? Again, like I, like I said, I used to believe that, Good contracts maintain good friendships. It doesn't. But at least when things start to fray, you can say, hey, you know, here's this piece of paper. What does this say? Do we have to? Do we have to get a third party in to look at this? Or can we just agree this is what it says? Let's chop it up this way and we go on our way or whatever. But uh, it, it's a business. You know, it, it's a very fun business to be in but this is ultimately still a, a business and you need to approach it that way. You know, it's interesting you neighbors for your friends and things like that. Yeah. You know, what's interesting about that is, um, so Dirk, I come from the, uh, collector r side of things, right? I'm, I'm the host mm -hmm. over here of a, of a YouTube channel that talks about, uh, collecting and speculating in comics. I, I'm nowhere near the industry side of things. So I, I kind of play that, that role of asking the stupid questions. And one of the interesting things that, we, I've noticed throughout the years is a lot of people who are new, getting into comics new or uh, be, have become a recent retailer, they don't think about the contract side. And you hear a lot of these new online retailers get into a deal, say, to do a exclusive uh, variant and they're, they're doing it 50-50 with another guy and the other guy, you know, something falls apart and they just... Yeah, uh, and they just they just chalk it up as a loss, and it's like, how are you not doing contracts on this? I never understood that. That's a big deal in the industry nowadays with a lot of new people. Yeah, well, it, it, it's important because you know, clear is kind, right? And everyone needs to have a very clear understanding of what's happening, what's going on. That way, if it does not generate the profit it's supposed to, everyone everyone knows what everyone's going to get or what you're not going to get. Right. But but yeah, this this is a business. And I know I'm saying this to people, a couple of retailers right now, but I think we all know there's a lot of people who have gotten involved in the comic book industry and, and even store owners who are not necessarily business people. Right. They yeah. are collectors and they are fans and they have extended their fandom into a storefront. Right. And oftentimes that's a tough that's a tough road to hoe, right? You know, the, the, the stores that are successful, the ones that treat this like a business. Now, it can still be a passion project, right. right? Again, comics are my passion. I bleed comic books. You can see this room. I, it's, it's around, I'm surrounded like my bat game. My office is full of comic books. I love comics. But you still have to have a business mentality about it. Sure. Right. This is, this is a business, you know. Well, and, and, and the reason I, I also, because... You know, we just saw each other two weekends ago at Toledo Fantastic yeah. Con. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And uh, you were over next to Sam Jones, Flash Gordon. Yes. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of other guys, uh, indie comic creators, that were over on the far corner of the, the convention. And I was looking, and I was like, man, these guys need to bring their game up. And I was talking to you. You mm-hmm. have constantly raised your own bar and you have outreach to retailers more than a lot of those kind of what I'd call artist alley exclusive guys do. Um, and you bring something to the retailer. You have a rabid fan base. Let me, let me first ask the question. Tell us a little about your rabid fan base and the gifts that they bring you. <laughs> I, Jim Valentino once said something about uh, he doesn't have fans, he has readers. And I always took that to heart. Um, I, I, I am very fortunate that I have people who are very, uh, passionate about my work, which is good because I'm very passionate about my work too. And, you know, I, I'm very open about stuff. When you read right or wrong, I talk about how, you know, you go to a comic convention and you're there an hour early and you're there all day and you're eating like trail mix and you're drinking like water, you know, and stuff like that. And then by the time you go out to eat and you guys know this, it's like eight or nine o'clock, you're eating dinner. And then you want to get back to the hotel bar to like, cause then you could finally see people for an hour yeah. or so. And then, you know, so point being long days. So over the years I've had like readers of mine and stuff like bring me ice cream or bring me cookies <laughs> and stuff <laughs> like that, the- you know? The Sprite cupcakes were the best. Oh, the, yeah, they, they brought cookies. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah. like, yeah, I'm a big ice cream aficionado. So, yeah, oh, yeah. liked by me. <laughs> there it is. Right? But, yeah, so, like, people have actually like, brought ice cream and stuff to the conventions or cupcakes and cookies. And then, of course, I'm, like, the most popular guy in my row because I can't eat, like, a plate of cookies, you know, so, like, my buddies that are nearby. And, and of course, you know, they bring, like, gingerbread cookies, like, with little top hats on them and stuff like that. But... It, it, I think it's just more just to embarrass me. I think half the time more than anything because I'm, right. But, the, but, but describing yeah. that fan base also leads me to the next thing, which is you do so many store signings and you have fans everywhere, and you do so many conventions. But I I think I did one of your favorite uh, store signings. Oh yeah. Uh, so Dirk is a Dirk is a legitimate non drinker. So if you see Dirk at a convention, he is at a convention bar. He is drinking a Shirley Temple. Right. So we decided to have. It looks like a drink. It looks like a drink. So if you don't know that, you just see Dirk's drinking a a vodka cranberry or something. Um, I do the same thing. Cranberry, just cranberry juice. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, so, a bright, it's bright and grenadine is basically what it is. Yeah, or ginger right. ale if you get the old school. Sure. Well, yeah. And that's what we decided to have a full Shirley Temple bar with a mm-hmm. bartender through the whole event. We had, <laughs> since he was in Michigan and he loves Michigan, we had Rock and Rye, we yep. had Fago, we had Verner's, we had, you know, we had all these beverages and you could choose whatever you wanted to make your own personal we had we had we had like fifty people show up to that assigning, and everybody was having Shirley Temples, mm-hmm. and and we sold so many of your books that I know your your people had to have already had the book, but they bought it again from our store from your from your stockpile that you would drag to the show, and right. that's something important to me. Well, you know, it's funny because. Then again, we're just gonna, I'm just going to pull back the curtain here. We'll go back to the radical honesty thing you were talking about earlier. Um, even when I was with Image Comics, you know, because I went from Image to Devil's Due, and, and I've been at Source Point Press for years. It blew me away that there were store owners who people would come in and say, I want to get the new book by Dirk Manning coming out. I mainly do original graphic novels. I do very <laughs> limited with periodic, periodical issues especially in our current climate. So they would go in and say, yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Oh, the old mariachi with John. Yeah. Oh, John, that's great. Chris. <clears throat> so, uh, oh God, so fun. I want to get back to the book so badly, mm-hmm. but, uh, everything in its moment. Right. But I would have people go to stores and say, I want to get the new, you know, the Dirk Mang's new book coming out. And they would say, well, you know, we don't really carry that stuff. And it's like, you know, people like, I would get horror stories of people going into sort of saying, well, I'll, I'll give you the money. I'll give you the money now. Is well, no, we don't want to keep track of it. What if you don't come back? But again, it's that mindset. And it's like, yep. 
in what world does someone come in and try to give you money because not only have you lost a sale, you've lost a customer. Well, there's three right? kinds of retailers when it comes to that, though. <clears throat> there's the ones that hear that guy say, hey, do you have this book? Uh, and you're like, no, I don't carry that. Sorry. I, I just don't mm -hmm. have room on my mix. I don't have enough money every week from Diamond or whatever. Okay, I get it. I get it. You 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 carry your 10 copies of Spider-Man, your 10 copies of Batman, and everything sure. else is ancillary. Then there's the guys like you, which is not interested at all because he has the money. He could order it. But then there's the third guy, which is me and Jesse and a bunch of other retailers that you work really well with. What is this Dirk Manning thing that this person is talking? If one person's asking for it, there might be two. Let me carry it. Let me stock one. Let me run into this Dirk Manning guy at a convention and tell him, you know, hey, I had one somebody ask for it. And then Dirk's like, oh, here, I'll, I'll sell you two of these at cost and, and you carry these in your store if he comes back. You know, and, and it, it's, I get it. There's not enough money to hit all the indie guys. Absolutely. But there is enough money that where there's smoke, there's fire. And like I said, um, you know, one of the things that we're talking about Brian with, You've had how many successful Kickstarters now, Dirk? Mm -hmm. I run personally, I think over, I've, I've personally have 13 on my account, but I've run about 15 or so. Wow. Okay. 15 or at, but, le at least but, 15. Yeah, but that hasn't affected your sales at conventions because no. you're selling a different product. That mm -hmm. didn't affect, you know, there's so many things that you can do beyond that. The relationship. Um, well, well, and it, and on Kickstarter too, and and it's really important to me that, and again, this comes back to what I was making earlier. When I started moving to a Kickstarter model to be able to sell to my people that want to get my stuff directly, I was very conscientious about not wanting to cut out comic book stores. So it's like, what do you do, right? Like, and and, and this is something I wrestled with for a long time. And again, just like, and I'll just say this point blank, just like I was one of the OGs of online comics, I was one of the OGs of comic book Kickstarters. I mean, you look back well, and I was the ground floor of this stuff. Do you remember the conversation we had in 2011 in our suite at the uh, the Hyatt in Chicago? Stick man farting. Yeah. So, <laughs> should, should we, yeah. Should, no, should we tell them that story? Yeah, let's hear uh, it. it, it yeah, if you go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I'll you know. start it. I'll start it, and then you can you can finish it. So okay. Dirk's telling me about Kickstarter, and I'm apprehensive yep. about Kickstarter. I'm like, yep. look, if you go straight to your fans, what am I going to be able to sell them? Right. And and not just that, but this whole in general, digital comics were starting to really bubble up at that point. So I had and off the cuff. I mean, I hadn't thought five seconds about this before we had this conversation, but. All of a sudden, it became super clear to me. I go, oh, my God. So what happens if tomorrow Marvel and DC team up and they get Alan Moore and they get Frank Miller to write the greatest story ever written? And they get, and at, at this time, uh, Turner was still alive, so God rest his soul. Um, Michael Turner and Alex Ross, and they get all of the greatest names in comics to write this. And it's called The Greatest Comic Book Ever Written. And they're going to launch it on May 1st mm -hmm. worldwide. And guess what? It could be shown up by a online digital comic of two stick men farting at each other. <laughs> <laughs> it could be eclipsed by something out of yeah. nowhere. And if they put that on Kickstarter, it could be destroyed. The whole industry could be destroyed by two stick men farting on each other. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how good yours, and then if you sacrifice, and this was the whole the whole point of pitching this to him, you sacrifice that retail at level to do this thing, it could still be absolutely torpedoed. I rarely admit on camera that I was wrong. I was wrong, but I was also right in a different way. <laughs> there it is, there's the caveat. <laughs> All right, so. So what what became you you can see how how much it I, I wish Jesse was here to hear you say that that's like he <laughs> stepped away at the worst time because they also go back no that was that was AI that was yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so one of the things that I, I really wrestled with this for a long time and ultimately what I decided was to to, to Dennis's point 
I kick the people that support Kickstarters, and, and Brian, you were mentioning this too, are your diehards, right? They're the people that support you usually. And there are again people that are really interested in, that are maybe like, oh, that's like a cool book. But especially when I was getting started with with crowdfunding, those are the people that know my work. They knew I was out there doing 20 shows a year. They knew my, my nightmare world from online. They saw me at conventions, things like that. Oh, Jesse, you just, <laughs> met, just admitted you was wrong on camera. <laughs> I swear. I it. No, no, Don't, Dennis admitted it. Red Hood, <laughs> Red Hood, do not clip that. <laughs> okay. What happened? <laughs> Dennis admitted that he was wrong. On oh my gosh! Yeah. Well, all right. So, uh, um, no. So uh, again, so this 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 thing was to me. I figured with crowdfunding, I'm like, these are the people that really are going to actively support me first. But I did not want to cut out comic book re re uh, retailers. So what I ultimately decided was, now I'll give you a perfect example here. Was like, all right. So I was doing all I did an all ages horror book, right? The Adventures of Cthulhu Jr. and Friends, right? This book, this is the trade paperback edition. But on Kickstarter, you get limited edition hardcover edition. Ah. Hardcover, right? Things like that. And and there's stuff in this, like, you know, uh, you would get like the cookie recipe and stuff like like little like tchotchkes or things <laughs> like that. You know, things that maybe that would be more difficult for comic book stores to order especially, um, you know, comic book stores that maybe aren't familiar with my work or maybe like in a part of the country that maybe I don't tour in a lot yet or things like that. But every Kickstarter I set up, I also set up a retailer pledge. So the Kickstarter I'm running right now. It's a, um, uh, um, hold on, Dirk. Yep. Whose idea was that, by the way? Having the retailer uh, that level? Was all, that, was all, that was all me. That was totally me. I came up with that fresh... <laughs> <laughs> no, this was part of the conversation Dennis and I were having was about the fact that, like, hey, I want to do something to keep retailers involved. So, you know, uh, again, what you can do, like I said, I'm going to do my cheap plug. It's late at night. You go to homesteadcomic.com. That's the Kickstarter I'm running right now. You can, there's a retailer pledge where you can go in and you can get sets of, like, the hardcover edition of the book if you want those if not you can get uh you can get some of the trade paperbacks so you can get both because yeah there it is right there because th this is a situation where how are you set to chinese i don't know Brian? i have no idea that's kind of weird isn't it wait wait dirk this is in english right this comic is in english <laughs> the comic is in english i promise okay. isn't that now, weird is, look at uh, that there, there is a lakota language in there but uh that's yeah, weird. That's, well, that's interesting. Uh, international. But no, I, I always set something up on my there campaigns where retail, uh, realtors, uh, retailers have a chance to gump, jump in for a retailer pledge level. And they get the books at wholesale price because whether it be stores that know my work already or people say, oh, like this Homestead book, this Native American Western werewolf book looks cool. That way you can still get... The variant cover, the hard cover, the ribbon bookmark, all the cool extra stuff we put in there, you can still get in at that at a wholesale Ooh. price. Right? Yeah, that's an interior page from the book. Ooh. Or if you want to jump, and I always pair that with some trade paperbacks as well. That way, as, as uh, store owners, you can charge a little bit more of a premium for the hard cover, but then for the casual people, you still have the trade paperbacks. Now, you can see in the Kickstarter here, we're doing stuff like werewolf mini busts and things like that and we sell t-shirts that stuff that most comic book uh, original art or statues that stuff that most comic book stores are not going to want to buy in on and i get that but really hardcore dirk manning fans or real hardcore werewolf fans or whatever they're going to want that stuff but this is a way i can still keep the retailers involved you know, they can jump in, they can get some limited edition hardcovers, but then after that, after the hardcovers are delivered, we then offer the books through direct distribution as well. So maybe someone comes into Jesse's store, Dennis's store, and says, you know what, uh, I heard about this, this, you know, Dirk Manning, this new book came out, Homestead, uh, I guess it was a Kickstarter a while back, my buddy had it, can you get the book? Yes, you guys can get the book through distribution. It's a trade paperback edition, it's a little bit cheaper price, it's more of what a, more of what a, uh, a standard customer would expect as opposed to a little bit pricier hardcover edition <laughs> with some of the extras in it, you know, 
So, well, and, and if that, that period of time, that 2011, 2012, when you and I were discussing this and a lot of yes. people were discussing this and, and a lot of retailers wouldn't even touch that because they didn't want to lose those relationships with the creators who were going to Kickstarter. Um, but I was fairly vocal about it. No, um, yeah, 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 yeah. And, but respectfully vocal with this particular topic. Um, and the one key moment for me where I really changed my attitude was, do you remember Ryan Brown and he had that God Hates Astronauts Kickstarter? Oh, yeah, totally. And it was, totally. The, first, it was the first kind of indie level Kickstarter to break that six-figure magic wall. Yeah, it was one of the big and, ones. Yeah. And I remember, you know, we had him at Fanfare 2012, I think. And uh, I met him and I'm like, okay, this guy's cool. And I saw what his Kickstarter was. And then when he showed up and I believe image, uh, uh, distributed him, uh, published him. Yep. Yep. The well, they, they level. Up. Yeah. Yeah. And what's and, interesting is, Oh, go ahead. Okay. No. And the, the simple, the simple thing was, is I got those in and I bought 10 of them just because I buy based on relationships. If I know you and I like mm -hmm. you and I support you, I just buy, I don't care. It's like me giving you extra money. And if it doesn't ever sell, no worries. Um, You'll we sell sold everything. five of them. We sold five of those on the first day. And I put, I posted to Facebook that day. Um, wow, yeah. And then a couple of my retailer friends were, oh, I forgot that was coming out today. I got to order some of those. Um, and it just, it, it occurred to me that at that point, just that this market play. is for somebody else. That, that Kickstarter is definitely for somebody else. I don't have to be scared of Kickstarter. Um, I can, you know, and, and that's where I started opening up to it. Well, especially when we're inviting you in, right? Right. Yeah. You know, that's one of the things that it's like, I get it. You know, uh, I, I have yet to do uh, a lot of uh, convention appearances and signings and stuff like that over by where Jesse is. But if, if there's people that know me from social media, know me from the internet and things like that out there, want to get the book. You can jump in and get, you can buy the trade paperbacks for normal distribution. You can get the hardcovers through me. But here's the thing. You can't sell it if you don't have it. Right. Yeah. And that's a big thing, too. And I understand. I'm never going to ask someone to go all in and spend hundreds of dollars on the stuff. But it's like, hey, put it out there and see what happens. Because you never know until you have it. Yeah. You know. But So, yeah, it, to me, it was, it was a very important. And it's funny because... One of the reasons I ended up stepping away from Image Comics when the Devils do is at the time Image was not interested in doing anything with Kickstarter because that same thing they were very concerned about damaging the relationship with the with, with the retailers, which I respected. And I said, but we can do like hardcover editions. I, I can do. I mean, respectfully, a store that doesn't know me doesn't want a hardcover edition of a Dirk Manning graphic novel. They don't. They don't care if it's like a. Uh, a leather bound, right. right? Gold gilded pages and the ribbon bookmark. They, they don't care about that, man. You know, they, they, they just want, maybe if they hear some hype about me, they want the trade paper back. Right. But that's eventually what led me to Devil's Due because Josh Blaylock, you know, I mean, he, he's, he, he saw what was going on. You know, he kind of licks his finger, puts it up, and felt the way the wind was blowing and said, yeah, you go. And we ended up doing, you know, uh, some pretty big numbers over there with Devil's Due for a long time on Kickstarter. But inviting retailers in. You guys are our partners. You guys are our friends. And, 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 and again, people that want to play in the pool, that's okay. You can't sell if you don't have it. If your clientele isn't into what I do or you have a specific niche that you're doing, hey, man, there's well, no shame in the, one That's of the fine. things. One of the things that I've just always been trying to preach is no man is an island in this. No man or woman um, is an island in this industry. It, it You're going to have to do trading with somebody else on another island. You have to you have to make those contacts and jesse and i have been trying to you know push that uh, as a, a sub narrative of this show is Absolutely. those relationships are the most important thing um mm -hmm. and it, it just and it also it, it goes to showing jesse and i both made tonight's phone uh, episode happen by me contacting you and jesse contacting brian and and now we have this great discussion about two guys that have 30 plus and 20 plus years into this industry. And, and the 20 plus year guy started out at a comic book store, 30 miles South of me, you yeah, know, the, you know, the other the guy, right. guy. <laughs> yeah, no, and, but that's, but that's the connectivity of this. And, right. and it's, yeah. it's a very small world. And when you have feuds like last week's and, you know, I got crazy with that too. 
Um, but when you get these feuds, it's like, guys, we we can all work together. There's a there's a level playing field we can all play on. And that's, you know, kind of work with your friends, support <clears throat> your friends um, and, and, and such. And, and you've been one of those guys that I've just gotten to watch for 14 years, Dirk. And yeah. you have impressed the hell out of me. Thank you. Well, I want to I want to talk. Uh, I want to ask Dirk uh, a question because this book right here, we, we brought it up, The Right or Wrong, A Reader's Guide to Creating Comics. There's only a few books out there that uh, touch on this subject. Um, and, yeah. and your book is one that a lot of people bring up all the time. W one of the things in comics right now that I think is hurting comics is the writing in comics. And a few months ago, you know, this whole big thing happened with uh, um, the comic sh Glenn in uh, Comic Book Palace and Mark Millar and, you know, talking about the ha what's going on in the industry right now and how can we help the industry. And I think one of the main things that keeps coming up is the writing in comics. It feels like a lot, like we're, we're missing something. I mean, the 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 majority of comics aren't good anymore writing wise they're great art the covers are beautiful i mean it, they look great in a slab but comics are about also reading and those stories and the the writing has been subpar lately at least in my opinion what is your opinion dirk on writing in, in comics right now you know ultimately i think what people have to realize is that when you're talking about corporate comic books especially uh, when I get to when, when right or wrong volume two comes out. So like the one you're looking at now is like a second edition of the first volume. Um, and I did the second edition preparation for right or wrong volume two, right or wrong volume one. And I'm going to answer your question. I promise. Yeah. It's all about how do you go from, I have a story to how do you make the book right or wrong volume two is going to be about now that you have a book, what do you do with it? And one of the things I, I, I talk about it in right or wrong volume two or what's written so far is how, Corporate comics are, I just call them roller coaster comics. You know, the characters start at a certain place, and it doesn't matter the journey that the writer takes you on, eventually they put them back in the same spot. It doesn't matter how many loop de loops they do, it doesn't matter how many corkscrew turns and flip the upside down, they're going to come back to the same spot. And it doesn't matter if it's a one year arc or if it's a five year arc, it doesn't, it, they're going to bring back to the same place. I truly believe we're living in a gold, a new golden age of comics, a renaissance age of comics, but I think some of the best comics are the creator-owned comics where we don't have to be on the roller coaster. You look at guys like Kirkman, for example, right, who, you know, with Invincible, he's still doing a superhero book, but he did something wildly. He did something with it that no, no corporation would let them do that to a corporately owned character ever, mm -mm. right? Walking Dead, another example, killing up characters left and right. Watchmen. Watchmen's yeah, yeah. a perfect example of that. I mean, you brought up Watchmen earlier and, and how important it was to you. Those were supposed to be those Charlton characters that DC had bought at the time. And DC was like, nope, you are not doing nope. this to our characters. Right. Well, and actually, let me let me interject because figure drawing just said something. Artists get paid dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign for a reason. Visual medium. Of course, mm -hmm. the marriage of art and writing is obvious ideal. But I, I say this and I've been saying this for almost 15 years now. Well, not even, no, 12 years. Um, if Robert Kirkman's writing were attached to somebody drawing crayon drawings of zombies eating cartoon character characters, would The Walking Dead be The Walking Dead? Right. And, and, and yes, the, the writing is something, and yes, the art is very important. However, when you marry those two things perfectly, that's when you get gold. Absolutely. And you, can you talk about picking some of your artists? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, figure drawing is exactly right. It's a very, very collaborative medium. And one of the things I talk about this in Right or Wrong, I talk about this at length. A lot of the book is about, because aspiring writers talk about all the time about how do I find artists? And a lot of the book is about this, uh, is about finding artists. But you have to find the, an artist who shares the passion for the type of story that you want to tell. And that marriage of art and writing, right? Like like, like John and Chris on, on Mariachi, right? Or Nightmare World. Every story in Nightmare World, which just celebrated its 20th anniversary edition. Wow. Source book, right? 
Cha Ching, nice uh, plug. Hey, you know, that's that's how we roll. But um, every story in Nightmare World, I catered the story specifically to the artist, and there are 52 eight page stories in here. But because you want to find an artist who shares the passion for that type of storytelling as well. It works best that way. There are stories I've sat on for years. Homestead's a perfect example. I'm not being a shill when I say this. Les will tell you if you talk to him. I talked to Les 11 years ago about Homestead. 11 years ago. And I told him, I said, look, finish Apocalypse Girl. I've got a couple of the projects right now. Les Gordon, I by the way. Uh, yeah, Les Garner. Yeah, Les Garner. Garner, sorry. Yeah, the Flash Gordon, that was earlier. That's um, right. Les Garner, um, he was doing a book called Apocalypse Girl. And I said, finish that book. I've got a couple things in queue right now. But the, the, I said, you will be perfect for this Native American Western werewolf book that I'm doing. Right. Um, and, you know, like Dennis, I think you even bought in on Apocalypse Girl at one point. Uh, yeah, there it is, right? Um, he wanted to get the book published. And, you know, kind of like the half joke is I wanted to work with them so badly, I took Apocalypse Girl to Source Point Press and got them hooked up so we could get the book published so we could then do our book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. You know, but uh, but um, that's the name of the game. You have to find, you know, uh, I showed this earlier, The Adventures of Cthulhu Jr. No one could do this book like Scoot McMahon. No one could do this like him. And there's some amazing cartoonists out there but and illustrators. But that collaboration is so important and that's where the magic happens you know uh so yeah that 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 that's a crucial part of the whole puzzle is finding the right artist who shares a passion for that type of story and you go that way so let me ask you this as a let's say as a publisher house is it is it that we have a lack of experienced editors before this is going to press and are you seeing this lack of consumer desirability that they just don't know what the consumer wants at this point i don't ever like to speak to other people's intentions and make okay. value judgments so i i don't know if that's the case but i i think it comes <laughs> down to what's the priority of the the publisher right and again i'm not going to speak to well marvel's intention is to make movies right, sure. or DC's, dc's to catch up with marvel but i'm going to say again when you look at corporate comics like Marvel or DC, they want to tell an entertaining story. They know Hollywood's watching. They're both owned by movie studios and, and, and to some degree. So I think that I can't help but think to some degree that probably factors in as opposed to creator-owned comics. A lot of people that make comics want to make movies. And I'll, I'm going to be point blank. I make comics to make comics. If someone, I, I've had talks with producers. I've had some stuff of mine option before and things like that. I'm not one of those guys that goes on blast about it too much because 99% of things that get optioned don't get made into movies anyway. Right. Sure. Yeah. You know, it's like buy the book. But I, I think what it comes down to is recognizing that that Marvel and DC, for example, they, they're going to take in a roller coaster. They're going to chop off Alfred's hand, but the next rare is going to come in, his hand's going to be back. <laughs> they're going to kill Magneto, the next rare is going to big Mag Magneto back. But that's okay because Everyone should have a chance to read Magneto stories or Joker stories or Alfred story with two hands or, or whatever. I, I think the reason that we're seeing such a surge in creator-owned comics and we're see, reason that we're seeing a surge in things like crowdfunding is because Brian's out there getting to tell the Lady of Death stories that he wants to tell. Yes. And I think people respond to passion and originality that we can do more freely in the independent creator-owned scene without that editorial oversight of, well, how are we going to make this new movie? Or, you know, oh, that character's popular, we'll kill him. Or, oh, that bad guy's popular, make them a good guy now. We can do whatever the hell we want. And I think people respond to that passion. They can sense that integrity of the storytelling. And, and again, I, I can't say the editors at some of the bigger publishing houses aren't allowed to do that. I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't work in that system, but I don't, but I would also have a hard time if you told me that people at Marvel and DC, for example, weren't hyper aware of the fact that any story arc they write could be the next movie or could be the next television show. So, uh, but I, I think readers, ultimately respond to original ideas told with passion. Well, and, and part of that <clears throat> also, what, what I've been talking about is 
you go out there and you know what the readers are wanting from you because you go out and you meet them 20 shows a year um mm -hmm. right before covid you guys killed it source point press went on the road um and they uh, you guys had a tour uh like mm -hmm. almost like a traveling road show where it was like, okay, oh, yeah. we got this, this artist is here with these two that are local and this artist mm -hmm. is over there and they've got three artists that are local. 50 to that conventions area. a year before COVID. Right. Source Point Press did 50 conventions a year before COVID. Right. Wow. And, and that's why they, they carved out that niche yeah. for mm -hmm. that, that new, uh, you know, that new, uh, flavor that everybody was looking for. And, you know, mm -hmm. they, they did good boy, right. You know, right. When mm -hmm. everybody was looking for a John Wick <laughs> dog story, you know, uh, you, you just look at all the stuff that source point was doing, but it was about getting these people, these guys like Dirk and, you know, K is it Kaylee Sm Smith? Uh, oh, Kaylin Smith, Kaylin Smith, you know, mm -hmm. getting these creators in front of fans at the place where fans go every week. And mm -hmm. and then you get the resonance of meeting these fans and getting to read these new readers who shout you out on social media. Um, and there's so many of these guys that are chasing those Hollywood movie checks that they just sit in their houses and they don't do that. Yes. And that's what I think is the important thing that's lost from the people who aren't as successful with 21 years like Dirk and like Brian. Well, well, yeah, and it, it's funny. I, uh, you guys can't see it on camera, but Jesse, yeah, that you, that you, and Jesse, all three of you probably know what I'm talking about. I've got an old school spinner rack right there, and when I say old school, it has on the top Richie Rich, Spider Man, yep. Archie, and Superman. Right? You know who I'm talking about. And I am. My goal has always been as a writer to fill a spinner rack with my own work. Yeah. Right, and now, and now, mind you, because I'm I'm a masochist and or sadomasochist this way, I, whichever one it is, I'm torturing myself. <laughs> I don't do it issue by issue. I do it book by right, book. by book. Yeah, right. So graphic novel by graphic novel, and I'm about ten away from filling it right now. Yep. But that's because I don't fall down that rabbit hole of, of chasing the Hollywood dragon. Right. Again, I, I've had uh, Wilder Valderrama option Nightmare World at one point. Right, Fez from that '70s show. That's how mm -hmm. I knew him at the time, right? You know, but but he was a big horror guy. He eventually did. Um, he did a very short-lived and kind of I hate to say this, what a flop of uh, Tales from the the Crypt remake. It had Michael Madsen in the in the pilot. He's a big horror guy, but I've worked with producers before, and I will tell you what: it can become a full-time job just trying to get your comic picked up as a movie or as a TV show. I just want to make the books. That's what I'm going to do. And people know where I am. I've been doing this 21 years. Go, Dirk, go to my website, dirkman.com. My contact information is there. My books are there. You can get them to retailers. You can get them to Amazon. You can get them wherever. If you want to talk about optioning my book, cool. And when I worked with Walter Valderrama, we did a short-term option. And it, you know, I said, look, if you want to option this around for three months, that's fine. And most people that, again, I don't want to speak to people's values or, or levels of acumen on this. But most people let their properties get picked up and optioned forever. Ooh. Like, no. You have it for three months. He goes, that's fine. He goes, because, you know, in three months, I'll know if I can get it done. And I said, if we had a deal, you had a three-month option, he could get an automatic three-month renewal. Or then at that point, if he wanted to option it for another three months at a time, he had to show it was, that there was actually something in production or moving forward. Right. And, and the thing is, is and a lot of people don't understand uh, and you can explain it more. I, I the money that they pay comic book creators for an option is pocket change for them. It's lint. Oh, yeah. oh, and yeah. but but for some creators, it's a house payment that month. Yeah, you well, know, and, so and that's why, and they that's dangle it. it. Yeah, and they and they give away their stuff. Yep. Yeah, they give it away. You know, I've seen, I talk about this in Right or Wrong. There's creators who have signed their life away to publishers, to producers. Yeah, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cite Jim Valentino said years ago one time, the, the, the person you should avoid more than anything is an independent producer. You know, because they, they, what they do is they hoard IP and then they put it in their portfolio and then you can never get away from it. 
But but again, I love comics. At the end of the day, I want to make comic books. I want to make my comic books available. I want to make it easy for retailers to get them. I want to make it easy for for readers to get them. I want to you know, and that that's what I'm about. That that's my passion. That. And if having a TV show made of one of my books gets more people to read my comics, awesome. But I'll tell you what, I'm not going to chase that dragon because, I, again, I've come close to some really big deals before, and it can suck up so many hours in a day so quickly. And then I'm like, well, now I'm two months behind on writing the next book. Mm-hmm. Then the domino effect of getting everything put out on time. And I'm, 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 no, no, I'm, I'm. You want you want an option? It write me the check, and just know you're not going to have it very long. You got to do something with it. You're babysitting. That's yeah. it. That's one of the and, best lessons I think you can teach people uh, in this industry. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, there's people that will conversely make ideas, sell it, and make another one. Yep. I mean, sure. that, hey man, no value judgment. I'm not. I'm not blaming and shaming. I'm just naming. That's sure. not how I do business. <laughs> you know, and, and if I. Because to me, like you said, Dennis, I get a house payment. I get two house payments. Okay, but then I gave up Nightmare World forever. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm, I'm good. I'm fine. Tell, I'm good. So tell me, this is, a, I'm trying to word it the right way. Do you have a passion for wrestling? What What is this? Tell me about wrestling in your mind, how you feel about it before we talk about what you've done. Uh, yeah, I am. I am a huge fan of professional wrestling, and I have been ever since I was little. Watching with my great grandma, you know, she would like always curse about like Gorgeous George and things like that. So I, I've been a lifelong fan of horror, heavy metal, and professional wrestling. And the fact that I've and and then, and then as a teenager, I discovered comic books. And the fact that. I have been able to entwine and inter- and weave all those things together in my career is just mind blowing to me, including as you're getting to professional wrestling, right. getting to do professional wrestling topics. Oh, it's yeah, funny. It's, because, it's, it's, real quick. Uh, it's funny you bring that up because just the other night I was uh, on down another YouTube rabbit hole where they were talking about the golden age of wrestling, which is the eighties. Mm-hmm. Right. And, um, they were talking about how uh, Vince McMahon's dad uh, was fighting um, uh, the Andersons, right, to to get yeah. a, a hold. And and here the next day, you're coming on the show, and here's the Arn Anderson, my life as an enforcer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah that book actually, and, and again, you know, we talk about Kickstarter and stuff like that. So what we did is, when we did the Kickstarter edition of this book. Their hardcover edition, gold gilded pages, Ooh. the ribbon bookmark. You could get a book plate if you got this on Kickstarter, signed by me, signed by Arn, signed by the artists. But this book came about because I did a book with uh, the professional wrestling announcer uh, Tony Schiavone, yep. from all of, you know, who, who's worked for almost every major promotion yep. ever. And the graphic novel that we did together on Kickstarter did over $135,000 on Kickstarter and was the first ever original graphic novel advertised on cable television. Because Tony got butts and seats advertised on All Elite Wrestling. And it's a weird accolade, but it's mine. Hell and I'm yeah. Take it. And I'm going <laughs> to take it. I'm gonna... But then Arn and Tony are friends. So Arn Anderson kind of reaches out and like, hey, when do I get a comic book? And mind you, I was going to be, I, I'd scratched that itch, Jesse, right? I worked with Tony Schiavone. I was able to give over 20 artists work during COVID, right? Uh, everything, uh, it was, again, the first ever original graphic novel advertised on cable television. It was an Amazon number one best selling book. Uh, it was uh, the largest crowdfunding campaign I had ever done. So I, I was good. I scratched the itch. I mainly like to focus on creator owned work. But then Arne Anderson knocks on the door, and I'm like, ah, one once more with feeling, yeah, <laughs> more with feeling. You know, Arne Anderson, he is he is your favorite wrestler's favorite wrestler, and again, you know, Dennis, you asked earlier about matching artists and stuff like that. It's also important to match the writer, and it's like I know no one. Like, damn it, no one will do this Arne Anderson book the way it needs to be done. 
And if he's asking me, he's probably going to ask somebody else if I say no. Well, that that too, right? And yeah. it, or, again, or I could have project managed it and handed it off to someone else, but I knew the way to approach that story. I knew there's a certain amount of finesse to do that story, and we we did something really, really cool, you know, and and really fun with that book. Uh, so yeah, but yeah, now I work with Tony Giovanni or Anderson. Um, this fall, I've got uh, we're doing the graphic novel adaptation of London After Midnight with uh, the Lon Chaney Estate, you know, the lost horror film. Wow. You're right. Yeah, yeah, I know. Like that's like <sighs> that. It blows my mind. I talked to Ron Chaney on the phone. You know, right? I'm watching watching those movies with my mom and my grandma and my great grandma back in the day. And then you know, uh, doing the book I did. You know, we'll give some Detroit flavor to this, Dennis. You know, working with Twisted. You know, and doing yes. the Haunted High End book and getting four Ring Award nominations on two volumes of that book. You know, with my love of, of, of music that way. Yeah, there, there it is. There it is. <laughs> Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about these guys because, man, we're, you know, we talk about ICP and Twisted a lot on this channel. Mm -hmm. uh, they, I go back. The very first job that I ever have, ever had, that where I, you know, had to get taxes taken out and stuff, I was 15 years old and I was working in a f fly by night uh telemarketing scam place that i didn't realize was a scam at the time but it, it was you know the the same thing that you see in all the movies you know just nothing but phones and phone books you know and the guy who owned all the telemarketing companies was the manager for icp so oh, we would <laughs> so we would see like uh you know these violent J and we would get these tapes and we'd be like who is this who right. is this and we fell in love you know as young kids with icp which most kids would at the time um right. and it's turned into this just huge amazing thing where you know everything that you could think of they're involved in and here is a, a comic you know that uh it, it little tree that's branching here well, yeah, and, and, and that's exactly. And what's really funny is before I did wrote comic books, I did music journalism for about ten years. Uh, again, huge music fan and stuff like that. And one of the bands I worked with a lot, being from the Detroit area, was the Insane Clown Posse. Well, I knew Twisted when they were still House of Crazies, and they were ICP's proteges, and mm -hmm. then became Twisted. Okay, years later, I, I, I finally, I get a music journalism, I get into my true passion writing comic books, and it was, Gary, again, full circle, it was, Dennis, it was Gary Reed who approaches me after we did Right or Wrong together, and he goes, Dirk, I, I got this band, and uh, I know you're a big music guy, and they want to do a comic book. And I go, okay, well, who's the band? And he goes, well, he goes, I don't know if they're really your thing. And I go, well, look, man, I'm a metalhead at heart, but I like all kinds of music, right? I, 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 you name it, I, I, there's, I listen to stuff in all genres. He goes, I don't know about this one. And he goes, they're kind of like a, they're like a rap band. And he goes, uh, they, they were with ICP at one time. He goes, their name's Twisted. And I go, Twisted? I go, yeah, that's, I know Twisted. That's fine. Right? That, that, they didn't really know me that way, but I knew them. I go, that sounds great. So we were working. So Gary is the one that put me in touch with Twisted to do the one shot. The book was originally going to come out through Caliber, and then we lost Gary. Yeah. And so what ends up happening is I um, I get a hold of uh, Twisted's manager, George, and who didn't really know me from Adam because everything at that point was still going through Gary and, and Paul Burke. And I, I went up to the office, and I said, look, here's the situation. I said, I still believe in this book. I think there's a lot of potential here. I said... I don't know what's going on with Caliber. I don't know the deal you had with Gary, but I said, I want to see this book come to fruition. And I said, if I can get you national distribution, would you be willing to, to follow, to take, to work with me to take this book to another publisher? Cause I said, I know you guys need national distribution on this book cause you're a national touring band. George agreed. I said, great. I go back. I call Travis McIntyre and Josh Werner from source point press. I said, I've got a book that'll do really well for you guys, but I you need national distribution. He said, yeah, we've been talking about it. And I'm like, I can get you a book that will sell, but this needs to happen to get you the book. Well, serendipitously, that was right around Baltimore Comic Con. They end up beating the Japanese stuff like that. Boom, boom, boom. So the first twisted one shot for Haunted Highons 
was one of the first one of one of the three titles in Source Point's initial debut into Diamond for national distribution. Wow! And it went there. Uh, we've gone on. Uh, Haunted High Ends has been nominated for the Ringo Award four times. Uh, best humor comic twice. Best illustrator. Best colorist. Um, but it, and 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 I have a lot of love for those guys. They now have their own Comic Con for the uh, eighth year, eighth time now. They're doing their own Comic Con, Astronomicon, and Livonia, um, Michigan. It's, it's like a Detroit fanfare in, in spirit because, in fact, Gary was working with them on developing Astronomicon when he passed. Well, and Gary and and Gary George and I went around and we showed them where our venues were and right, show, right. we basically opened up our books to them to help yeah. them you know uh go off and take off with this yep. and now and now they're in charge of kevin smith's mm -hmm. uh chicago uh high Chronicon, and Chronicon, they also do yeah. they also do silver scream with ice nine kills yeah right but again it kind of comes back to what we were talking about earlier with this right pay it forward mm -hmm. yeah you don't, there, there's no competition man look yeah I, I have no problem helping anybody out that wants to talk about making comics, make comics, because the people I'm helping are not my competition. Ideally, they will be my peers. And I had people help me. I want to help other people. I, I just feel bad. I don't have enough time to give to people one on one directly. So I tell if people come to me at shows, ask me about writing comics. I'll talk to them for me. I'll say, look, I did not spend two years writing this book to bilk you out of $20. Okay. But. This is everything I could tell you about getting started. Is that after you read this book, if you have questions, I give them my email. I say, email me after you read this book. But there's no competition. Uh, heaven help us, there's only one Dirk Manning, right? I do books that I can do. And I want to expand the diversity in voices. And I want people to create, it, it comes back to what you were saying, Jesse, independent voices. Not, I want people to write comics to want to be able to write their own comics and not necessarily have to feed into the corporate machine. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. If you want to go and, um, you know, get paid a, a salary to, get, to, to write comics about your favorite superheroes, knowing that you will probably then not be invited to the premiere of that movie, knock yourself out. Not that, again, that's your values, but I just want to help people be able to enter this industry, make comics. Well, I, I've been so, I've been so fortunate. I mean, man, my life has been so incredible. I mean, it's been ups and downs, believe me, but still, I would not, I would not trade most of it for, for almost anything. So, so, uh, Brian, can you pull up the, the image I just pulled up for you? Uh, yeah, one I just second. shared a Facebook post. So, back oh, yeah. to just Gary Reed. Uh, one of the lessons that I learned from this is, uh, I wrote this the night before his funeral. Uh, I spoke at his oh, funeral yeah. and yeah. it's the 10 lessons that I learned from Gary Reed and Brian, you were there when I shared this with, uh, James from hive, um, there at San Diego. And to me, this is just the life lessons that I, I try to tell everybody. And, and you said it perfect, Dirk, um, lesson, there it is uh where is it at it's uh i mean we can we could go through the whole thing here you can never com com uh, conquer the comic book industry it's okay to fail and move on uh set your sights on completing the job don't do anything you don't enjoy work with people you like give your knowledge and experience freely rule number six and you know that's where you know both jesse and i and Dirk and Gary, especially, um, and, and Brian Polito earlier. Uh, it, it's just important lessons that you don't realize you picked up until you start filtering it through your, th past your own ego. You know what I'm saying? Right. right. Well, and, and Brian said it too. He's made mistakes. We yeah. all make mistakes, yeah, right? Sure. Yeah. But, sure. but, you know, and, and I think we live in a culture right now where it's, it's very it's very endearing to tear people down and make yourselves look taller, but this is a situation where I used to have three. Whenever I did uh, panels about writing for comics, I used to end it with three rules, and the three rules were two words each. Very so six words. I said you you follow these six words, you're gonna be successful no matter what you do. And I've evolved them. I'm gonna tell you the original. I'll tell you the new ones. My original three rules were work hard. You can't get anywhere in life without putting the effort. Be nice. 
and no excuses. So that was my original three rules. Work hard, be nice, no excuses. And I always said, everyone struggles with one of the three, right? I evolved that a couple of years ago. And I always said, you know, instead of work hard, I say work smart. Yep. Right, work smart. Because there's a lot to be said for putting in the muscle and the hustle, but at the same time, we're, our, 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 our economy is adapting, our delivery, we, you have to be smart about it. You have to be adaptable. So work smart. And then instead of be nice, I change it to be kind. Because one of the things I found is that when you're nice, you, uh, nice people don't have as many boundaries as people who are kind. I can be kind to you. We should, we should demonstrate kindness. But being nice, sometimes it gets very easy to be taken advantage of. So work smart, be kind. And instead of no excuses, I change that to give grace. We all make mistakes. We all screw up. You have to give grace to yourself, but you also have to give grace to others, right? You know, social media, people tend to present them best selves, well, you know, and, and everyone's struggling. Everyone, everyone struggles. Everyone stumbles. So now I tell people, if you want to be successful, work smart, be kind, and give grace. And if you do those things, you're going to be successful. You stay in your lane. You do your thing. You help other people out the best you can with kindness. You work intelligently. You give grace to people. And, um, you know, 21 well, years I, later. Yeah, I think one of the big things is I've, I've, I've always gauged the most important part for a convention, for a retailer, publisher, everything is this the, the after party, right? Where you yep. go, where you hang out, who you choose to hang out with who invites you and i've always been someone that always in the right spot at the right time or i was the one hosting the party or whatever and mm -hmm. i would always walk out go into the restroom or going to say hi to someone you always see that one person by themselves yeah. they have excluded themselves from the comic book industry and for many reasons number one they might feel we're not successful enough to be with them. Number two, they might not be able to react to people. Number three, they probably screwed so many people uh, uh, that they don't feel they can walk in there because one person is in there that they didn't pay them or whatever. And it's those type of people that are always holding themselves back and not understanding that even with the three things you just talked about, those are very important, but you have to be socially adaptable to your surroundings and who you're surround, uh, surrounded by. And mm -hmm. I think that's very important uh, to look at just how you react beyond the selling of a comic book or describing your comic book is, hey, I'm at this party, I'm hanging out with some people, uh, let's get to know them. Uh, and, and I think that's the important part in our industry. A lot of people don't do that. And I just, it blows me away. Even the the quick handshake, hey guys, I'm, I'm over here. Let me walk over here and say hi to these guys. Hey, guys, what's going on? Boom, and you're out. And that's kind of how you build your brand because we're always building our brand. So I think that's very important. No, you're absolutely right. And here's the thing, too. I'm an introvert. I When I am not working, I, I mean, again, you see all these books? I sit there and read my books. I'm quiet. And one of the hardest things for me was – to get out there and start talking about my books and talk to other people and things yeah. like that. But you're, you're exactly right, Jesse. It's about building your brand. And I'll never forget. I was at Pittsburgh comic con, uh, you know, before it became murder con, uh, years ago. And I, and you I beat would, me to it. I, I knew, I knew Dennis, I know you were, I knew what was coming. So I remember at the time I was sitting at the table and I, and Josh Ross, uh, the, the, the artist who I was with earlier in the picture of the ice cream cone, and we were sitting there, and I had high quality stuff that Nightmare World stuff on my table. This is high quality stuff. And I see people walk by, and I see people walk by, and I see people walk by. And uh, I remember finally looking over to Josh, and I just said to him, I said, No one will love our babies like we will. Yep. And I turned and I stood up and I started talking, and I never shut up. Right. <laughs> you know? yeah. But I mean, because that's it. You, you, that's something like when you see me at convention, you do, if I'm sitting down, I'm probably like stuffing like a power bar in my mouth or right. something like sure. that. You know, I, I'm there to work, you know, yep. and, and yeah, I'm in a suit, but I got tennis shoes on with insoles in them because I'm standing on concrete all day. But 
every convention is someone's first convention. Well, and when you go to the after party and you meet people, again, just just be kind, be graceful, yeah. introduce yourself. We're all there because we like comics. Just, just, yeah, be cool about it. I'm sure. going to throw you under the bus here because I, I, I always love watching Dirk in action. So, like I said, he was right next to Sam Jones, uh, yep. yada, yada, yada. There's a guy. Now, by the way, Flash Gordon, I used to watch that when I was little. So. I, dude, it's my favorite movie. Um, so, yada, yada, yada. This guy comes through with the chips. Remember the chip guy? He makes homemade yep. chips. Oh, yeah. So oh, he, was, he was so ecstatic to let everybody. He's handing out free bags of his chips, and he hands Dirk a bag of chips. And he's like, oh, and then Dirk just immediately is like, oh, this is great. Thank you. Have you seen any of my books? Blah, blah, blah. The guy bought, what did he buy? Arn Anderson? Yes. Okay. So he buys an Arn Anderson. He's got his two little daughters with him. And they're basically carrying the bag of chips that daddy is at the comic book convention. And Dirk reaches under his table and is like, you know, I don't see a comic book in your hands. And he pulls out the free comic book day, Cthulhu, what is it? Give me the title. Cthulhu and Friends. Cthulhu, yeah. yeah. Pulls out two copies of it, autographs it, and hands them each one copy, one one of those. And they both it just lit up. The two little girls just lit the hell up. Yeah. And they they were getting dragged along. And, and, and no offense to the guy, because the guy is really cool. But yeah. in their minds, dad's dragging us along. And I've seen the look on my kids' faces as I drag them to go meet that old Stan Lee guy for the fourth time, you know, or whatever. And they're just like, oh, God, do we have to meet this old guy again, dad? Yeah, 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 yeah. Go say hi to Uncle Stan. Um, and yada, yada, yada. But you lit those two little girls up who thought the rest of their day was going to suck dragging bags of potato chips around. And and that's what you do, man. That's what you do. I've seen you yeah. do it a million times or a thousand times, but you right. did it in front of me there, and it's <laughs> it's like breathing for you. Well, uh, again, you know, people don't remember what you're selling as much as they remember how you make them feel. And uh, like you said, man, th those two little kids were walking around, and comic book shows are those of us that do a lot of conventions. We forget how overstimulating it is. Right, I mean, there's pictures everywhere, and there's people. It's like a pinball this. game. It's like being in a pinball yeah, yeah, game. yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, it's like a living pinball game. And uh, what happened? Yeah, and, and and I always try to do that at shows is to keep just a couple of the floppies of things that are all ages accessible, you know, uh, for the kids to come by. And again, this dude, and don't make no mistake, I mean, this guy hooked me up with these amazing like garlic parmesan potato chips that we talking about earlier, Jesse. It's like <laughs> that's the thing during a show. Of course, then the potato chips were greasy, so you gotta get Yeah, for that. sure, but. Yeah, you know, those kids now will forever remember, I got to go to the comic book show, and I got some free comics. I don't care if they remember it's a Dirk Manning comic. Yeah. I don't care about that. Sure. But I want to introduce them to the medium, and I want to introduce them to this, this a, a love of literacy and a love of art and an appreciation of this stuff and an appreciation of these social experiences that they can have there. And, yeah. and if I can take 30 seconds to two minutes to do that, and I'm out of buck or two. I don't give a shit, man. Yeah. You know, because that moment's going to hopefully live with those kids for a long time. Yep. And that's, I tell this, that's what it's about. I tell this great story. This happened um, about four years ago. And this customer comes in, and, and he has a Las Vegas shirt on. I go, oh, you're, do you like Vegas? Oh, I'm from Vegas. I said, oh, cool. I'm from Vegas, too. And uh, where'd you go to high school? I went to uh, Bonanza. Okay. I went to Western. Oh yeah, I was. I went to that. Remember that game that um, the the smoke bomb came on the field. I'm like, yeah. If you go look at the video, I'm actually the receiver in that. So not a big deal. Okay, coincidence, right? Right. So he gets a pool box, and about uh, four years into his pool box, he comes in wearing a Riviera shirt, and I go, oh, hey, you you used to go to the Riviera, and he goes, yeah, the very first. Uh, convention I went to was in the Riviera in, in 1982. I go, oh. I go, you know what? I was at that convention. And he goes, yeah, I bought my very first comic book from this young little kid that had his, uh, um, had a little stand of 10 boxes. And I said, was that kid by the Star Trek lady uh, in the blue lady, whatever her name was? And he goes, yeah, but yeah. that was me. So this guy had 
from 1982 had remembered this young kid selling I, books yep. and all of a sudden he's a box holder in Glendale, Arizona. And so every moment you have with a customer is a, a timestamp and yes. our jobs are to extend that timestamp as long as possible. And so that's how I look at that. Those two little girls 20 years from now, uh, whatever is then walk up to your table and they said you're the guy that gave us those two comics and that's the believe it or not the comic book world is very small, very small. um it's it's a very small tight unit you know i was kind of trying to think in my head when you're talking about trade paperbacks i'm thinking yeah but most comic book fans are numerical buyers mm -hmm. right? right so our right. challenge in the store is do we sell the numerical uh mm -hmm. buyer or do we saw them the trade paperback do we wait we sell both but do we have that monstrous one through six and am i going to tell them yeah. at issue four oh no no wait for the trade paperback right right, right. you right. gotta you we're in this challenge of every customer we're making these decisions uh and hopefully helping them direct their way how they buy books so it's very yeah. interesting when you do tell stories about giving to little girls to free comic book day books because uh, at the end of the day even if you lost twenty dollars the value you get over time you you, you can never pay for that right we, it, it brings a, you're right it brings a full circle because this is a business that's true but we're also human beings and, yeah. and, and to create those connections with people and you can't lose sight of that you can't put the money ahead of giving someone those positive experiences and then like dennis said those kids were dragging ass man i mean their yeah. dad their dad's taking them around, you know, supporting his business with these these locally made potato chips, which again were so good, so good, you know. But yeah, to give them that experience and things like that, and to bring in potentially two new readers into this medium, you know, I mean that that's that's priceless, you know. And that that's the stuff, like you said, I don't care if it was two dollars or if it was twenty dollars, you know, just to to pay it forward like that, and and hopefully, you know, I mean, hopefully you get that back someday somehow, right? You know, oh yeah, sure. Well, in my, come back to the paper back? Maybe they never will. It doesn't matter. They had nice one experience. of my favorite yeah. moments in uh, owning a comic book store was this. This gentleman came in, uh, you know, several times. Uh, I recognize him, but he definitely shopped at another store. And one day on a Saturday, he came in with his daughter, um, and the gentleman was after African American, and his daughter was African American, and uh, and he's picking up his regular comic books, and the little girl's just kind of wandering around looking, and I'm like, hey. I got a comic book for you. And she had her hair done up in the little pigtails and and she's just she's not interested in what daddy's making her go to. And I right. put the Marvel timely reprint of Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur mm -hmm. one through three in her hand. And she looked at that comic and there's something you can say whatever you want. But that Black Panther cover where the two kids are looking up going, that's me. You know, the, yep. I, I saw that yep. in real fucking time. Oh, yeah. That little girl yeah. with that comic book in her hand and just the nonverbal look from dad like, oh, my God. Thanks, man. I, yeah. I didn't know she had this passion in her until I saw her light up this yep. three dollars. I get her three issues of this comic book that looks like her. I, I, I don't think I saw them again. Uh, they maybe came into the store a couple times after that. I don't know. But the point is, is I know that moment I saw that spark yep. that was and that's some that's something you can't. Mm. No. Hey, you know, Dirk, I, I want to jump off this. I just realized this was sitting next to me. So I started in the comic book business January 25th, 1982 is when I got my very first comic book, which is right here. That's my very first comic book I ever got. Friendly Neighborhood Comic Book Store. This is the exact book. And I was standing in front of his door. And I was a skate punk at the time. And he goes, can you move a couple of steps over from the door? And then being a punk, I just took one step over, right? right? So he came out and he said, if I give you this book, if I give you this book, will you leave? So I went home and read that a thousand times. Uh, that is from Tom Heiner. Uh, every birthday, I talk to him. Uh, you know, he's up in his, you know, late seventies now. And right. this is the guy that got me started. He also is the guy that hired me for his comic book store a couple of weeks later at 12 years old. So here's a free comic that started my career 
And so that's how it, it's amazing. Amazing stories come from that first comic. Yeah. yeah. The first comic I ever bought, like when I started buying when I was 13 years old, I'm dating myself a little bit. <laughs> this is literally the one. Yeah, there I you go. This at my local skateboard shop. I talk yeah. about it in right or wrong because I was a voracious reader and I was a skater kid too. I had my Steve Kevler <laughs> and, board and stuff like that. Yeah. I went to the, the, the skate shop and he had like the, 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 the long magazine racks full of comics. And the thing that attracted me was, oh my God, if I can find a book I like, I will have new reading material every month. Mm, yep. It was like, oh, and I'm looking around, I'm looking around. And I'm trying to find some looks cool, and I saw Incredible Hulk 364, Peter David, who you know I think one of the best comic book writers of all time. Uh, Amen. And, but what drew me to it was two things. One was I remember the Hulk show from when I was young, but two, I was like, oh, cool, it counts down part four of one. I'm like, yeah. that's, and I've never met a give, I've never seen a gimmick I didn't like. I'm yeah. like that's cool. I'm gonna check this out. And there it was, you know, yep. and then I, and then real quick after that, it was like, you know, Crow, Watchmen, Dark Knight, or Dark Knight, Watchmen, Crow, boom, boom, in that order, I think what it was. But yeah, that that's it, you know, but having comic books available in different ways, or like you said, just putting them in people's hands. Like yep. I said, this, this guy that ran that, that skateboard shop was um, clearly a comic geek, because I mean, he, he went all in, right? He must have had the deal with, with Diamond or whoever it was at the time, because he had about 60 or 70 up there on the wall all new stuff but uh i love that that's my favorite thing is to hear about those stores like that uh we have uh, one of my good friends who's also a co-host on this channel my buddy nate tells a story about when he was a kid um where he he lived in a small town and he on the east coast i think north carolina as he said and he whenever he would go with his dad to the tire store he knew that the tire store had a little area downstairs that sold toys and oh, he yeah. he would go and get his he-man or his gi joe's there so now whenever he thinks of like toys from that time period he smells new tires Right, because yep. this little tires, yep. you know, and those are the stories that I love, and I love hearing um, about you know these hobbies, nostalgia. Nostalgia really drives a lot of our hobbies, and and comics is, is is up there as one of those number one nostalgia things that just when it hits, man, it's stronger than any drug there is on the market. You know, Absolutely. so. Good stuff. Uh, Dirk, what do you have yeah. coming? Do you have anything coming up uh, that you're going to be out and about uh, where people can come find you, come talk to you, come uh, get stuff signed and, and, and see you? Yeah, absolutely. My, my full convention schedule is always updated at uh, DirkManning.com. Uh, this weekend, I will be at Bowling Green State University at Anna Marathon. Uh, I actually graduated from Bowling Green State University, so it's it's cool now to be able to – I'm not an anime guy per se – but I've been going back there for over a decade now. They have me back as an alumni of the college, and uh, so I'll be there. Um, April, I'll be at Astronomicon, which is Twisted's convention up in Livonia, or over in Livonia, and then at C2E2, uh, which I, I tell people all the time, you know, as far as the Midwest goes, if you want the big show experience, can't afford a San Diego, can't make it to a New York, go to C2E2 amazing show it's it's my um, ki my kids have been to new york and my kids have been to san diego and they've go to they've gone to c2e2 for over seven or eight years maybe 10 years mm -hmm. uh it's their favorite show C2E2. yeah I, lo I, I love c2e2 then may for the f word free comic book day i'll be making my yearly pilgrimage to uh i think friends of some of yours jamie Teresa on a pack rat comics in hilliard ohio I've done their free comic book day every year since the beginning. Uh, I get invited all over the country now to go to free comic book day. I'm at Pack Rat Comics every year. They had me before I was even, when I was self-publishing, they had me down there. And I told Jamie and Treese, I said, this means nothing to you right now, but you've been so kind. I will always come back. And now it's been how many years? It's now been, they can't uh, get rid of you. <laughs> oh, yeah, now they can't get rid of you. Right? Yeah. Now they show me that they don't want me there on free comic book day. And then I'll be doing uh, Cherry Capital Comic Con up in Traverse City in May, and I got some stuff scheduled up. A there. great show with the Gary Reed Award. Uh, yes. Every year. Yeah, I think I've been nominated for the Gary Reed Award more than anyone else in the history of the award. Uh, <laughs> so I'm like the Susan Lucci of that award. <laughs> Maybe but, this is um, the year. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm done. I'm done even, you know, entertaining. I think it's just a... Uh, yeah. Well, listen, I had somebody told me that those type of things, you don't want to win it because when you win it, you don't get nominated for a couple of years, right? Yeah. So. Well, that's that's exactly it. You know, it's an honor to be nominated. Uh, it, it truly is. But, uh, yeah, so I'll be up there in May. But, uh, yeah, DirkMang.com has my convention schedule, has my bibliography on my books. And, and again, one more time. My Native American Werewolf Western comic, Homestead. You can go to homesteadcomic.com. There is retailer, there's retailer pledge levels. I'm just putting it out there. But uh, for people that, you know, want to check that book out, uh, it's a really fun book. Uh, we actually have, uh, I'm working with a, or worked with a uh, Lakota creative consultant on the book to really make sure we honor the authenticity of the Lakota culture. It's part of the book. Um, and that is at uh, homesteadcomic.com. And, uh, yeah. People and can just follow me on social media at Dirk Manning. Just look for the guy at the top hat and the scarf. That's me. There we go. Or at least that's the photo of that is a social media. Me, well, well, thank you so much, man. And we're going to have you back on the show again. Uh, we I really appreciate that. you. We love your point of view. And uh, it was an honor to have you on the show tonight, man. Oh, no. Thank you guys for having me on. Jesse, Brian, Dennis, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate this opportunity. And I appreciate everything you guys do for comics. So. Thank you, and thank you all of you out there as well. Thanks. All right. We'll see you soon. Thanks. That was good stuff, man. Great, great guest. I told you. I told you. He gives gold, man. He gives gold. Yeah. Good stuff. That was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I I think when you start listening to the Pleitos, the Mannings, they all have the same kind of goal, which is pivot. Uh, find the right platforms to get your product out, uh, create a brand that uh, people will like. And then I think there is a personal aspect of it. Uh, You know, these are people you shake hands with and you like immediately. Um, And in the comic book industry, there's a lot of people you have that handshake with and and that's the last time you talk to them. So we, to have these two guys was awesome on the show so yeah. and i had no idea about the the <laughs> jc's comic uh 1995 thing he just pulled that up and i was like oh my god that's so perfect yeah yeah that was good stuff uh speaking of kickstarter i want to give a big shout out to a good friend of the channel and another great content creator Sw- swag shout out to mickey uh if you guys don't follow swaggle house comics on youtube Make sure you guys go sub up. He is putting out uh, new content from his Sanity series, Rise of the Occult, the Kickstarter that he did for the first issue a few, um, maybe a year ago now. And he's doing uh, issues one through three now. And look at this. He's already met and surpassed his published total goal of $10,000. He's at 16534 If you guys want to uh, support a, another great content creator... That's and, in one day, I believe, too, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. He's killed it, yeah. man. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, congrats, Swaggle House. Yeah, I think when it comes to uh, crowdfunding, I think what, what people don't understand is you're, Go ahead. you're making this decision. Do I want to share my margins with a distributor first of all they gotta get approved from that distributor, uh, and a publisher if you want to go the other route yeah yeah exactly yeah. and the publisher so you, it's a very challenging thing so when you do go to a someone who's crowdfunding uh they've made some smart financial decisions in doing this are is every kickstarter successful no but those Kickstarters that aren't successful most likely wouldn't have made it with the publisher anyways. Uh, there's also the aspect of direct to customer. So you're creating this relationship. It's the good old my Tampa Bay Buccaneers, right? Well, <laughs> I contribute to this publishing or this Kickstarter. They feel they are part of this. So Kickstarters, I think, have brought in a lot of consumers that traditionally might not be able to go to a comic book store because there isn't one and also get some closer to the creator and the team itself. Well, and it goes to what I said when I said, you know, when I apologized, when I said I was wrong, um, I saw Kickstarter as the threat. And that's until I realized, wait a second, there is a way for both of us to exist. And, and you know, Dirk proved it. Uh, Ryan Brown proved it. So many other creators have proved it that there 
is an island out there for your Kickstarter, but there's also retailer things that you can do to be a part of the retailing world and take take in all of those customers those retailers have kind of on lock. Yeah. That might not have heard about you or heard about right, Kickstarter. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, there was uh, it's kind of a slow uh, news week for comics. Um, there wasn't much that, uh, you know, new stuff that I really saw that to, to kind of talk about. But I did see two new Spawn books getting ready to be started. They're doing that Rat City. And then there's another one that that uh, he's doing, which is very interesting. That says a lot yeah. about uh, Image and Spawn right now. New writer. Yeah. And new writers. Yep. New writer on that as well. So uh, so that's, that's going to be a very interesting thing. I, I think that biggest news is this eruption again in live streaming uh where we're seeing um that the rules only last for just so long oh, right yeah. and yeah. all of a sudden people start saying well if i can get away with this and then go ahead and continue to do it before they tell me i can't do it but what happens is other people start doing it and so you're surrounded by all these people doing it wrong, right? So uh, yeah, I've that, been that's in that part of world. integrity, right? I mean, yeah. that's something. Uh, shout out! To, we we have a good friend that brings us up a lot. There's the two eyes, right? Integrity yeah. and inventory is what it takes yeah. to be to to be um, successful in this live streaming sale game, right? Yeah. And that integrity is so important. That integrity yeah. of you know, when once money get involved gets involved, it says a lot about the person's integrity, how they navigate, how they handle. You know, um, we see a lot of people make some 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 not so smart decisions when money gets involved, yeah. and the integrity part is so important. Uh, yeah, I think the integrity part is so important, but it actually starts with your community, mm -hmm. uh, and your community has to be the ones that say. Listen, my job is to sell, build my brand, uh, and and do the same thing tomorrow. Uh, and then when you start seeing that breakdown in your community, then you have to decide, am I a key holder to this? Am I a steward to this? Does it affect my business? Well, technically, maybe not, but it does. Because then if you do your research and you see that one person buying that unlicensed book, and they spend $40 and that's your customer. They just took $40 from you. So you have to be very vigilant. Uh, you know, I'm going to stand on my soapbox and I'm going to yell and scream and I'm going to do everything to, to try and make our community safer. But on the flip end, you also need that platform to jump in and, and say, listen, these are the rules. We don't have nudes, right? which means you don't have nudes. That does not have to be explained. We don't have mystery boxes. Why don't we have mystery boxes? Well, because it's gambling, right? And if you're gambling on a live stream and Johnny, who's 16 years old, buys that in Kentucky, right? That goes through seven states, right? Mm -hmm. Every single state you're breaking the rule, not just one, right? Or the law, basically. So we are in that phase where live streaming continues to grow at this extremely fast pace. A lot of people that do it don't have license. You know, they don't have tax IDs. They don't have stores. And that's fine. I'm not, I, I, all for well, that. But like, but, like I said last week, though, you should have those goals. Yeah. You should have those achievements. You might only be here right now. But when are you go? When do you feel you're going to need that tax license? When are you going to sure. rent that spot? Sure, sure. Yeah. And and so that comes with experience. And I think when you do get in the money grab world, you're you're in that fast cash. You know, you're just fast cash. You're not you know, when when someone sells something unlicensed, you know, and you don't tell the person and they get their whatever Spider Man book and they're bragging with their check out this Spider Man book and they're like Where'd you get this from? Oh, I got it from XYZ. Oh, so it's not actually a Spider-Man book. You know, it's fan art. Well, fan art is very interesting, right? Fan art was created so someone could create whatever they wanted to. And I don't think too many people care if you're at a convention, you sell 10 copies for $5 each. But when you start seeing the people selling these 
copies for $70, $100, and they're selling 40, 50, 60 of them, that becomes a problem. Uh, so hopefully down the road, this is, um, I hate using the word policed, but it does need to be managed much better. And I think it also needs to be uh, explained and coach much better. Right. Well. And I think so, what we're seeing is a lot of policing your own, um, yeah. you know, the anti AI conventions, Indiana comic con. I think that might be the title of it. I apologize. Sure. if It's not just put up a big AI with a slash mark through it. Like we will not have AI art at our show. Uh, okay. Like I said, I just want to, I don't want to see it divulge into a, the game werewolf where, you know, everybody starts pointing at other people and said, mm -hmm. they're the werewolf. They're the, you know, and, and, you know, you can trust AI to spot the AI at a certain point. Well, can you, I don't no. know, but no, but here, here's the, here's the problem with conventions saying no AI. If you say no AI, I don't want your webpage in AI. Yep. I don't want your program in AI. I yep. don't want any words in AI. And, and the problem is they all do it. Because right. why? Because number one, it's cheaper for them, and it's they're easy. trying to cut their costs. Uh, and and so that's the problem. We have people saying, "Well, you can't do this," yet they're doing this already. Uh, and well, listen, it's a virtue signal. It's a virtue right. signal because they know sure. they can't prove the other stuff, so they'll prove the one thing they think they, they think they can prove, and that usually turns out to be bad. Sure. Exactly. So I, I think what we're seeing across the board, whether it be AI, live streaming, is we have this culture shift. Uh, we have to get on top of it, be in front of it. Uh, and then at the end of the day, understand it's not really our job, right? So you can only push it too much until it starts affecting your business. You know, if someone walks into my store and I'm right anti-AI, which I'm not, but if, if I'm anti-AI and I tell that customer, oh, we don't have any, any AI books before I even say hello, right? I've hurt my business, right? Yeah. So that's what I think we have to look for. But there's always news in the comic book world. It's just a lot of it doesn't hold any drama to it or it doesn't hold anything that is then change the scales in any way. Yeah. Customers are then come in, pick up their new issues. 90% are walking in, grabbing their new issues, doing a little bit of shopping, walking out. And that's the last thing they know about comic book news. Uh, that 10% that does know comic book news. Yeah. They're, they know that stuff and they'll make their conscious decision. A lot of that. What the funny part is a lot of those people, the 10% that know all the comic book news, that react to it usually don't have comic book stores, right? That's the key because they're not surrounded by that comic book store community. Yeah. So right. it, it's 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 interesting. So, yeah. well, it's been an amazing show, you guys. We just hit the three hour mark. I think that's becoming our sweet spot. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And I love uh, how this was going to be a one hour show when we yeah. first started talking about yeah. this. Yeah. So the three yeah, hours. The first thing I said to Dennis was. Um, uh, he said, oh, an hour and a half. I said, dude, trust me. We won't even realize that third hour. So, hey, Bubba, what's going on, buddy? Yeah, good to see everybody in the chat. Yeah. Uh, appreciate all you guys that support our show and, and everything we do over here at Beyond Wednesdays. If you're not subbed up, please hit that subscribe button. If you haven't hit the thumbs up or the like button, whether you're catching this live or on the replay, please do so. And drop a comment let us know what who you want to see on the show if there's anybody out there if there's a store owner that you would love to see on the show uh, me personally i would love to get uh glenn from comic book palace on the show at some point so we're going to do that we're going to try and reach out to him yeah. we have some big names we have some names that you might not have heard of that are big people in this industry coming uh on the show and we're always looking to get more and more people and to uh, learn more about the industry from a collector's point of view and uh, have these great uh, store owners and retailers and, and people of the industry talk about you know, their peers. Well, so. And I think tonight was the perfect example of uh, just building. And then, you know, like me last week in Georgia, middle of nowhere, somebody who watches this show, watches your shows, just ha heard my voice and saw me in a random comic book store that I just popped in to visit. And you don't, one of my favorite movies is six degrees of separation Oh yeah, with yeah. Will Smith. And I, it, in this business, it's like three, yeah. three degrees of separation. Yeah. 
And you have to understand that, man. You have to be zen. You have to be like water uh, just to understand that every person you touch is another person that's going to know this person. Jesse's story about the guy he sold a comic book yeah. to 42 years ago. Yeah. 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 You know, well, it's, it's here's, perfect. It's a perfect yeah, here's, encapsulation. Yeah, here's the funny thing. So I'm a pitcher guy, you know. I don't know what the, how many pitchers I'm in, but I've always been a pitcher guy. Rob Liefeld, pitcher guy. I'm a pitcher guy. Plito's a pitcher guy. And for years, I've talked to Steve McDonald. Clan McDonald. Know, and yeah. about five weeks ago. And a clan, yeah. And uh, I go, you know, one day I hope I meet you, right? And we've been talking for this whole time. And he starts sending me pictures. So I'm at 30 30 freaking bars with him <laughs> and, and you just don't realize it right and uh, so i think it's a fun business and i think if you find the the good part of it the fun part of it it will always outweigh the bad part of it i had to leave why because i was buying a collection over the phone right and i'm going with sheer trust I got 9,000 books. I got this. I got, okay, how much do you want? Well, okay, done. I got to get back to this show. Uh, and so wh what happened? My team went and go went and picked it up just right now. So um, oh, that's yeah. how we do business. It's yep. this fast pace, and, and they trust me. I trust them. Boom. So, yeah, three hours, fun. Next week, folks, you are not going to believe next week. It's going to be freaking awesome. Uh, it's going to be stacked. So very excited for it. Yeah. So. Uh, make sure you guys come hang, hang out with us again tomorrow night. We'll have the Wednesday show. We'll go over a new comic book day. We'll have the, uh, the market report, and uh, we'll have a lot of fun. And so share this. Guys, share this on your socials and let people know about the show. I think anybody who loves indie creators has to love Brian Polito. And if they've never heard of Dirk Manning, tonight's the night you share it with them and tell them about Dirk Manning. Amen. We'll see you guys next time on our Industry of Comic Book Show. Adios. See you.